Father in heaven, I surrender myself to you and I ask you today, God, to use me that I may declare the words of life correctly and simply. Put your words in my mouth. Teach your people, dear God. And at the end of this session, let us leave knowing we have learned about you. And by learning about you, we've drawn closer to you. Bring those who are on their way safely, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right, let's go to Genesis 1. My favorite book, the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. And I told you yesterday, all major salvation doctrines have the origin in the first three or the first 11 chapters of Genesis. All major salvation doctrines. Genesis 1, let's read from verse 1. <clears throat> when you found it, say amen. Now I'm reading from the King James Version. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Pause. Who said, Let there be light? God. But here's a little puzzle for you. In verse 1, when you read, In the beginning God created, the word God is plural. Elohim, when we read verse 3, let us, uh, let there be light, who is speaking? Well, yes, but, uh, <laughs> all right, is it the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost who said, let there be light? Somebody, so it was a choir of three people who sang the song, let there be light. Or was it one person who spoke? Okay. When the voice said, let there be light, that was the beginning of what? Creation. Creation. Keep this in mind. Now, let's go to John 1. Let's read from verse 1. John 1, let me get a marker. Reading from verse 1. John 1. Read with me if you have it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so we have, as we said yesterday, we have the Word, and we have God. The Word was with God. Verse 2, the same, which is the Word, was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 says what? Now, we have two individuals. We have two individuals. Verse 3 says what? All things were made by him. So how many is that? How many is him? One. Well, the Bible is teaching us one of those two created. Now, who is this one? We know who that is, God the Father. But who is this? How do you know that? Yes, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who came down from heaven and took human form? Jesus Christ. And so we know immediately then the Him is Jesus. Now verse 3 says, all things were made by him. Go to verse 10. Read verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And so we have him again, and we have he. Not them, or they were in the world. He was in the world. Verse 11. He came under his own and his own received them not. And verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, keep reading, and we beheld what? 
His glory. And so we're dealing with one person. That's Jesus Christ. Now, Genesis 1-3, what does the Bible say? And God said, let there be light. Who spoke those words? Christ. The creator is the same person who died on Calvary. Because he died to save what he created. Let us go to an interesting section of the Bible, Hebrews chapter 1. We will see where the Father identifies Jesus Christ as the creator. Hebrews chapter 1. Is the Father speaking? Let's read from verse 7 of Hebrews 1. If you have my version, read with me. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. That's the function of the angels there. They're the ministers of God, they do his will. Verse 8. But unto the Son, in other words, the Son is different from the angels. The angels are ministering spirits. Look at verse 13 of chapter 1. Go to verse 13. Read it for me. But to which of the angels said he at any time, what? Sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Read verse 14. Are they not all, what? Ministering servants. That's what the angels are. They're servants of God. Now. We go back to verse 8. What's the first word in verse 8? But. But introduces a contrast. There's a vast difference between the angels and Christ. But unto the Son, he saith, read with me, Thy throne, O God, come on, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, that is God the Father speaking. We could have begun at verse 1 and worked all our way down, but I didn't think he wanted to do that. So we just went to verse 7 and 8. Read verse 8 again. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne stop. What does the Father say the Son has? What does the Son have? A throne. If you have a throne, what do you do? You rule, you, rule, you, uh, you, you reign, you rule. The Father says, thy throne. What are the next two words? The next three words. What two words? No, no. The next two words after thy throne. Oh, God. Now, listen to me carefully. You must concentrate. Who is speaking? The Father. We know the Father's divine, fully God. What does he call the Son? calls him God. Now, listen to John 1.1. 1, no, just listen. In the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Both are divine. Now, they have different functions, but they're both fully divine. Now, let's read all of verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is what? Forever and ever. What does forever and ever mean in that context? Without end. Sometimes it does not mean without end. But there it means without end. We'll see that in subsequent verses. The father says the throne of his son has been forever and ever. What does that tell you about Christ? He's eternal. The person who said, let there be light. We're looking at Genesis. Is fully God, he's eternal. Now let's read all of verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy... What does the Father say the Son has? A kingdom. The Son rules with the Father. There aren't three kingdoms, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Son, and the kingdom of Satan, there too. But the Father and the Son rule together. A scepter of righteousness 
is the scepter of thy kingdom. In other words, what is the central feature of the kingdom of Christ? Righteousness. And we'll get to that from Genesis. Now, what have I said so far? Or what has the Bible said so far? We went to Genesis 1, 3, 1, 1 to 3. We went to John 1, 1 to 3, then 10, 11, 14. Then we went to Hebrews 1, 7 and 8. What has the Bible told us so far? Think, think. Don't, don't be afraid, just say it. Jesus Christ created. Mm -hmm. Jesus, is eternal. Jesus is eternal. He had no beginning. Big mystery. How can someone with no beginning come as a human being? The greatest mystery in the Bible. Anything else that the Bible has, has told you this morning? God. That what? God. He's God. Christ is God. The Bible doesn't say Christ is the Father. It says Christ is divine. Fully God. All right. Go to verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Now, what does that tell us about Christ? What does it tell us about Christ? He loves, and then we'll, disco we'll discover what righteousness is that Jesus loves so much. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now read verse 10. You read it for me. And thou, Lord, in the beginning. Stop. Where did we come across in the beginning? Genesis 1.1. Yesterday we looked at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We looked at John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then we looked at 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which you've heard, which we've seen with our eyes. And so now we're reading, Thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth. Finish verse 10. And the heavens are the works of thy hands. Now who is speaking? The Father. What does he say about the Son? You're the creator of the heaven and earth. They're the works of your hands. Now, well, let's go on a little more. Let's go to verse 11. Read for me. They shall perish, but thou remainest. What does that mean? He doesn't end. The heavens will pass away. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Keep reading. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. Keep reading. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy ears shall not fail. Eternal. Now, let's go back to Genesis 1 3. We're looking at Christ. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Who was that? Jesus Christ. Now, he wasn't called Jesus Christ then. But it's that person who came in human form and died for your sins and mine. To redeem the world. And so the Bible identifies Christ as the creator. Who became our savior. We've also discovered that Christ is eternal. We also discovered that the father called Christ God. Now, why would the Father refer to Christ as God? What is there about Christ that makes him God? Well, many things. But in the context of Genesis 1, when he said, let there be light, there was light, that's creation. Now, creation occupies a position above all the other abilities of God. Let us go to Jeremiah 10. We need to understand, let there be light, and there was light. That's creation. What's the significance of that? Jeremiah 10, let's read from verse 3. We're in our in-depth study of Genesis. And if there's anyone watching us live by internet or the recorded version, thank you for joining us and we hope the Lord will bless you as verily as he's blessing us right in this room. What book did I say? What chapter? 10, reading from verse 3. When you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me if you have my version. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, 
the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. Stop. What is going on in verse 3 of, Je of Jeremiah 10? What's going on? Look at it again. For one does what? Cutteth a tree out of the forest. Somebody goes to the woods and cuts down the tree. Can you see him cutting down the tree? The tree falls. Now, verse uh, 4. They deck it with silver and with gold. What does deck it mean? They cover it with Precious things, silver and gold. Keep reading. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Keep reading. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Keep reading. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. Now, what is Jeremiah describing? Idols. Idols are made by people. People are made by God. Let me say that again. Idols, false gods, are made by people. We are made by God. Jeremiah is going to contrast the true God from false gods. So he first begins by describing how a false god comes into existence. A false god is made by people. Go to verse 10. Read with me. But the Lord, he is a true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. Now, why does Jeremiah say, but the Lord is the true God? He is different from the false God we read about in verse 3 to verse 5. He's different from that. Now, what makes him different from that? Read verse 11. Thus shall he say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. Now, Jeremiah, God tells Jeremiah, here's what you say. The gods that have not made. What is it that separates God from false gods more than anything else? His ability to create. Go to Psalm 96. Psalm 96. We read verse 4. You have Psalm 96? Read verse 4. What does it say? Verse 5, sorry. For all the gods of the nations are but the Lord. So we have a contrast. False gods and the true God. What is the, the, the leading quality of the true God? He can create. Of course, he creates with his word. Now, let's go to uh, Isaiah 40. We'll read from verse 25. We're looking at Genesis 1, 3, let there be light. Who said that? Christ. What's the significance of the fact that Christ can create? Well, we're finding out only God can create. And creation, more than anything else, is what God uses to separate himself from all false gods. Isaiah 40, reading from verse 25, read with me. To whom then... Do you have Isaiah 40, verse 25? Do you have it? Read with me. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Is there anyone in the universe equal to me, says God? Keep reading. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath what? Created these things. God is saying, look, for you to understand why I cannot be compared, just look at what I have made. Creation. More than anything else is what separates God from false gods. Stay in Isaiah. Go to chapter 45. We'll read verse 18. Isaiah 45, reading verse 18. Are you ready? For thus saith the Lord that created what? The heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. Now read the last part of that verse carefully. I am the Lord and there is none else. Now, read that verse again quietly. Then I have a question for you. All right, should I finish that verse? Here's a question. Give me one word that describes what that verse is about. One word. 
creation. Listen. For thus saith the Lord that what? Read the verse. That created the heavens. God himself that formed the earth. And made it. Come on. He hath established it. Come on. He created it not in vain. Uh -huh. Go on. He formed it to be inhabited. That's creation. Then the verse ends this way. I am the Lord. And what? What does he mean by there's none else? No one else can create. Mm -hmm. Go to verse 22. Read with me. Look unto me, and be saved all the ends of the earth. Come on. For I am, and there is. Give me one word that tells us what that verse is talking about. Salvation. Now, why does it end, I am God, and there is none else? What is he trying to say? No one else can save. So in verse 18, no one else can create. In verse 22, no one else can save. If Christ, if Adam had not sinned, would we need Christ and Calvary? No. We won't need a Savior. But there's always need for a Creator because He who creates sustains. Creation is what God presents as proof that He is different from all other gods. And so when we read Genesis 1 3, and God said, Let there be light, we're listening to the voice. Sorry, of the one who said on Calvary, it is finished. Or oh, why hast thou forsaken me? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the same person. Genesis presents to us the creator who became our savior. Christ. Genesis tells us, therefore, that Christ is fully divine, fully God, because only God can create. Let's move from Christ. We can spend all day of, on Christ. Yes. Uh, you say that if Adam had sinned, Christ still would have to die. Mm -hmm. uh, but if Eve sinned, Christ, Christ still didn't have to die. You see, listen to Romans 5.12. That takes off a little. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. The world had to be redeemed because of Adam's sin. How God would have handled Eve, I don't know. But the world fell into sin because of Adam's sin. And so Christ came to redeem Adam's fall. All right. Let's look at Christ differently. Read Genesis 1-3 again. Come on, read it, read it. And God said, uh-huh. How was the light made? By the word of God. Commandment, yes, yes, which is the word of God. Now, this, the power that made the universe is right here. I might have said that yesterday. It's right here. I'm not talking about paper and black ink or red, whatever color you have. I'm talking about what the word says, the living word. It's right here. Now, Jesus says in the first temptation, Matthew 4, 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall what? Not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We are to live by God's word. Whether that word is the whole Bible or that word is the Ten Commandments. Before sin, we didn't need the Bible, but the commandments were there. After Christ comes and we live in the new world, we won't need the Bible, God's law will still be there. So the word can be the word of God, the law of God. We are to live by God's word. When you read, let there be light, and there was light, what does that tell you about God's word? Immediate. It is immediate, okay, uh-huh. It has tremendous power. Mm -hmm. Tremendous power. Someone else. Let there be light and there was light. Not let there be light and there was a fog. Let there be light, there was light. What does that tell you about God's word? It's real, yes. It's true. It's, it's what? It is specific. 
<laughs> it is specific. God doesn't leave us guessing on essentials. The word of God is specific. Example, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. That is specific. Let there be light. There was light. God's word is powerful. That's God's word is specific. What else is there about God's word? Let there be light. There was light. God's word is creative. Is that what you said? Who said creative? Or well, somebody said. Okay, all right. God's word is creative. And creativity is a divine quality. The ability to create is a divine quality. What does that tell you about God's word? It does like it says, yes. But listen again. Someone said correctly, God's word is creative. But creation is only something God can do. What does that tell you about God's word? It's I thought I heard the word. It starts with a D. It's divine. God's word is divine. <laughs> Let's look at God's word away from Genesis 1-3. Let's go to Genesis 1-20. You have that? Read for me, what does it say? And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Now, quiz question for you. What was made in that verse? Birds, what else? Fish. Question for you again. Are birds living things? Are fish living things? Now, and God said, that's his word. Let the waters bring forth abundantly moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth. What does that tell you about God's word? Okay. It gives life. God's word is life-giving. And Genesis introduces us to the life-giving word of God. God's word gives life. We looked at that yesterday without stressing God's word giving life. How did Christ raise Lazarus? By the word. Christ never entered the tomb. He just spoke. Lazarus came. When Christ comes back, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, with the trump of the archangel, with the voice of God, and he calls the righteous dead, he just speaks. The word of God has life, and when we receive that word, we receive that life. Go to John 6.63. John 6.63. Are you there? All right, read for me. What does it say? It is the spirit that quickeneth. Stop. What does that mean? It is the spirit that gives life. To quicken is to give life. So God is the judge of the quick and the dead. Quick is opposite to dead. Quick means life. It is the spirit that quickeneth or gives life. Keep reading. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you. Come on, finish the verse. They are spirit. Come on. And they are life. I cannot explain how God's word is life. It's a mysterious thing. But there is life in the word of God. But what kind of life? Eternal life. Give me another word. All right, everlasting life. This is the word I want starts with a D. We said it earlier today. It's divine life. 
But who or what is the source of divine life? God. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Therefore, the word of God contains what? Life, be more specific. Be more specific. Put a person, put a person with that. The word of God contains... The life of God. Don't ask me how. That is why it is the word God uses to change people. Listen to Ellen White, Christ's Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1. What did I say? Christ's Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1. All right, here's what it says. The scriptures are the great agency in the transformation of character. Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Then she goes on to say, if studied and obeyed, the word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. How is, is a person sanctified? By the word of God which has life. And so when we read, let there be light, and there was light, we know that word is divine. That word carries the very life of God. It has in it the characteristics of God, the character of God, the life of God, the power of God is in God's word. That's the Word of God. When we study the Word of God and obey it, it reproduces in us the character of Christ. Go to John 15. Let's read verse 1, or from verse 1. Then I'll set up a sort of an algebraic formula for you. John 15, let's read from verse 1. When you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Read verse 3. Now ye clean how through the word which I have spoken unto you. But Jesus says, the words I speak unto you are spirit and they are life. So Jesus is saying, you are clean through the life-giving word that I speak. You see, the power that cleanses me is the life of Christ. The power that heals is the life of Christ. The power that forgives is the life of Christ. You know, we say, well, we're saved by his blood. Yes, the blood is the vehicle that carries the life. That's what the Bible says. The life is where? In the blood. It's the life of Christ. Verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Now, let's look at something here in verse 4. Read verse 4 for me. Stop, stop, abide in me. All right. What's the next statement? Okay. I in you. Keep reading. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Keep reading. He that abideth in me, stop. He abideth in me. We have that repeated. Same thing. That's an M. Keep reading. He that abideth in me, go on. I in him, stop. So we have I again in him. Go on. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Let's look at what we have so far. In verse 4. Abide in me, I in you. In verse 5, he that abideth in me and I in him. We have the same thing. 
Do you see that? All right. Let's go to six. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now let's read verse seven. Read on now. If, if ye abide in me, pause, ye abide, or ye or man, in me. Okay. Now, what should we have over here? Yeah. What we should have is an I in him. To be consistent. Are you with me, uh, Mr. Cameraman? I'm walking out of your frame. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, watch carefully. You all mathematicians, you're bright. God gave you tremendous brains. Verse 4 says, Abide in me and... So on this side we have, abide in me. On that side we have, I in you. Verse 5 says, abide in me. And on that side, I in you. Verse 7 says, abide in me. This side should say what? I in you. But it doesn't say I in you. What does it say? If my word <laughs> abide in you, then... What does that tell you about the word and I? Same thing. Then. But where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus now? In heaven. Is he flesh and blood, yes or no? Yes. So he can't abide in me, personally. Then how does he abide in me? Mm -hmm. But he told us in John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. So he abides in us by the spirit-filled word. Hmm? Mm -hmm. This. When you decide to keep God's holy Sabbath, because the Bible says so, that's Christ abiding in you. Is it a mystery? Oh, yes. Christ abides in us through the Spirit-filled Word. What does the Bible say in Genesis 1-3? And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God's Word is the power of God himself. It is the life of God himself. It is the holiness of God himself. It is only by receiving God's word that we receive God. Let me pause. Ask me a question. Yesterday we got through very few subjects, and I had a whole long list. I want to get through a few. Yes. Please lock mode for your expensive. Let me make sure mine is, well, turn mine off. Lock mode, please, lock mode. Oh, flight mode. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. That's what you call lock mode. Airplane mode. Okay. Mm. Please do that now so we have a quality recording. So those who cannot be here or cannot join the live stream can benefit sometime down the road. Okay, I'd ask you now, ask me some questions on what I have said so far. I'm just wondering, yes. is Christ's word more significant than his Is Christ's word, Christ, let the Bible answer that. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Psalm 138 verse 2. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His word is above his name. You see, his name is built by his faithfulness to his word. That's why when we doubt God's word, we call him a liar. You see, how do you doubt a word that says, you look around, you look at the heavens, how was that made by the word? The grass, how was it made the word? The atmosphere, the word, and then you doubt it. The ultimate insult to God, and the Bible tells us, to doubt God's word is to make him a liar. Another question. Yes. Plural, yes. Does that mean that um, when the Bible mentions God, there are different meanings that are given to it? 
But then you have to know what the, the, the underlying Hebrew word says or Greek word says. Yes, yes. So then is there like variations in Hebrew Well, there's LOI, which is one member of the Godhead. For instance, go to Mark 15, 34. Mark 15, 34 is LOI and Elohim. LOI singular, Elohim plural. Mark 15, verse 34. Now this is Christ on the cross. He's crying out to his father who had turned away from him because he was covered with all the sins of the world. Mark 15, verse 34. Do you have that? Read for me. What does it say? And at the ninth hour, Christ did what? Cried with a loud voice saying what? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which being interpreted is my God, my God. So we have Eloi there means singular. He's speaking just to the Father. But sometimes you have Elohim, which means more than one. It's going to be the Father and the Son together. So when the Bible says, let us make man, uh, in Genesis 1.26, that's Father and Son. Uh, let us, God created heaven and earth, that's Father and Son mentioned in verse 1. It doesn't mean Father and Son spoke together, but they were agreed on it. But the actual person who created and said, let there be light, is God, Jesus Christ, L-O-I. Like cherub is one angel, cherubim, more than one. Seraph, one angel, seraphim, more than one. All right, any other question based on what I've said so far? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you know it is wrong, you ask God to give you the power to obey him. You cannot worship any form of idol, physical or if the idol, may, the, idol, the, uh, the idol can be a false doctrine. For instance, there's no Bible verse that supports Sunday as the Sabbath. People insist on doing it, that's a form of idol worship. So if you, you, it is the power of God in you that allows you not to worship idols. Obedience to God is possible through the power of God. So if you think you're worshiping idols, you ask God, please deliver me from idol worship. Let me say it again. Obedience to God is possible only through the power of God. Because obedience to God is obedience to a divine standard. And a human being by himself or herself cannot live up to a divine standard. You need divine power to reach a divine standard. Both the letter and the spirit. Anything else based on what we've, we looked at Christ? We looked at the word. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's true. That's true. No, no. Not for physical healing. No. But to be saved. You've got to hear it some way. To be saved. But you're quite right. The servant never heard. Matthew 8. Jesus spoke it. And the word did God's work. God did the work of God. True. Very good. But to be saved. You need to hear God's word. Somehow, some way. Anything else? Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, it, yes, if it's the word. Yes. A secondary source can mention the word of God. So a secondary source uses a primary. Yes, someone else mentions God's word. Yes. Mm hmm Uh-huh. Uh -huh. They've never heard the name Jesus. Yes. We'll be in the kingdom. Yes. 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 But you see, you can hear not only through these, but through internal conviction. Somehow the Spirit speaks. Don't do that. And you obey. That's how gracious God is. All right. Let's switch to another subject. We cannot exhaust Christ or his word, but they're my favorite subjects. Now. We go from Christ, so you understand, let me, before I erase this, it is through the life, the spirit-filled word that Christ abides in us. Why can't he not abide in us personally? Because he's physical. He's both man and God. 
He's, he has a flesh and blood just like you. He has bones. Mm -hmm. He has scars, which he took to heaven with him. So he can't be in you. But the Spirit can, and the Word can. So Christ abides in us through the Word. But as I said in one of my presentations during the weekend, that's not close enough for Christ. He wants to come and be with us personally. That's why he's coming back, to take us to a place where there's no sin. Or so he can be with us, not through the Word or the Spirit, but by himself. All right. Let's go to Genesis 3. Don't go to Genesis 3 yet. Go to Genesis 1. Let's read verse 11 of Genesis 1. You have Genesis 1. Read verse 11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding seed mm -hmm, after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Okay, what day was that? Look at verse uh, 13. In the morning with her. All right. So day three. All right, day three. We have trees and grass, but we just put trees. Now go to chapter two. Let's read verse nine. Genesis 2 verse 9, read with me. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was made when? On the third day. All trees on the third day. If you don't read chapter 2 carefully, you'll think it came after. No, all trees made on the third day. Because at the end of day six, God saw everything he had made. Behold, it was good. Now, when was Adam made? Day six. When was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil made? Three. When was Adam made? So before Adam was made, what existed somewhere in the universe? Satan had rebelled, Lucifer, against God before creation. So before Adam and Eve were made, there's evil in the universe somewhere. All right, now let's find out where the source of this evil is. Chapter 3, verse 1. Read with me. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, do serpents talk? No. The animals are dumb. Animals are dumb. Are you with me? So what's going on? The dev there's a power using the serpent. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, What? Ye shall not surely die. Now, God said, Surely die. This voice said, Not surely die. What is that? What does God say? What does this person say? What is that? It's opposite, it's opposition. This being that spoke to the serpent opposes the word of God. Remember, God does everything through his word. All of creation came by the word of God. The enemy attacks the word of God. So God said, you'll surely die. The enemy said, you will not surely die. So we know now that this power, this enemy, we know to be Satan, is opposed to the word of God. 
We're taking a look at Satan now. There is a power in the universe that is dedicated to overthrowing the word of God. Not church. The word of God. Because this power, his best agents are in church. If you don't believe me, listen to the church people saying, crucify him. This is the devil. Let's go to Revelation 12. Revelation 12, we read from verse 7. The last book of the Bible, Revelation 12, reading verse 7. Are you there? Read with me. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Stop. There was a war some time ago in heaven. The two armies are headed by two generals, Michael, a name for Christ, and the dragon. They fought. Michael with his angels, the dragon with his, verse 8 says, and prevail not. Neither was the place found anymore in heaven. Verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out. That all serpent called the devil and Satan. Now, we have four names. What's the first name? Dragon. Serpent. And what else? Devil. Satan. But look at this one. Why is he called? Now, keep reading verse 9. Which deceiveth the whole world. Now, this is the work of the serpent to deceive. It's the work of the dragon to destroy. The work of Satan to uh, accuse. And the work of the devil to oppose, to be an adversary. So be sober, be vigilant, because the devil, your adversary, walketh about, seeking whom he may desire. And I saw Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, Zechariah chapter 1, 3 verse 1, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him by accusation. So we have accuser, adversary, deceiver, destroyer. But of those four qualities, this is the one he uses most effectively. Because he used destroyer to kill the, 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 the martyrs, but the more he killed, the more people joined the church. Are you following me? Then he stopped using this so widespread, and he started using this. He mingled some paganism with the Bible, and the church just exploded with a lot of hypocrites. And so this is, <laughs> more than anything else, what he uses. Now, go to 2 Corinthians 11, read verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11, reading verse 3. Read with me. But I fear lest by, uh huh, as the did what? Beguiled Eve. Stop. What does the word beguile mean? Deceive. The serpent beguiled Eve, Paul is saying. Keep reading. Through his subtlety. Of course, that's Genesis again. The serpent was more subtle. So Paul is quoting directly from Genesis 3, verse 1. Hmm? Keep reading. Your minds. From the what? Simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. By the way, the gospel is a simple thing. The moment it becomes complicated, uh, maybe it's not the gospel. The fundamentals of the gospel are very, very simple. Your problem is sin, the solution of Christ. Your culture has nothing to do with it. The problem is sin. The solution is Christ. Your enemy is the devil. Your advocate is Jesus Christ. All right. So we have this being called the devil. Let's find out a little more about him. Let us go to uh, Isaiah 14. One of the greatest favors you can do for the devil is to believe he doesn't exist. The greatest favor you can do because you make no preparation for someone who doesn't exist. What book did I say? Isaiah, what chapter? 14, reading from verse uh, 12. Read with me. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
How art thou cut down to the ground which this weakened the nations? Now, here's how he got into trouble. Read, read on. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. This angel that God created, his name was Lucifer. That's the name he had before he uh, took on the name of Satan. Lucifer means light bearer. So we have Lux, Pharaoh. Lux is light. Pharaoh is to carry. So you cross a river on a ferry. You got Pharaoh to carry. Lux, light, Pharaoh. Lucifer means light carrier, light bearer. Verse 15, read for me. Yes. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, come on, to the size of the pit, or stop. In other words, you oppose God, you attack God, your final end will be destruction one day. That's what the Bible is telling us. Let's find out about him before he rebelled. Ezekiel 28. You read from verse 11. Ezekiel 28, reading from verse 11. Have you found that? Read with me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, What? Son of man, take up this what? Against whom? And say what? Uh huh. Thus said the Lord, What? Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Stop. We need to untangle the expression, sealest up the sum. What does sum come across to you as those of you mathematicians, statisticians? What is the sum? The total. Mm -hmm. Thou sealest up, now watch this carefully, thou sealest up the sum. The sum of what? Let's add, full of wisdom. What's the other statement? Perfect. Come on, talk to me. In beauty. See, let's up the sum. When God made Lucifer, Lucifer represented the highest expression of the creative power of God. Not the universe, not the world, not the trees, not Adam, not Eve. Lucifer was the greatest expression of the creative power of God. That's why he sealed up the sum. The sum, nothing God had made came close to Lucifer. full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. No other creator. Listen to this quotation. The faith I live by, page 66, paragraph 2. Tell me what I just said. <clears throat> Listen to these amazing words. Oh, astonishing. Speaking of Lucifer, Ella White writes, God made him good and beautiful, as near as possible like himself. Which means, if, we're talking about that power that came into the garden. This is God. This is divinity. The closest thing to God was Lucifer. The greatest power in the universe after God, Lucifer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Divinity, God of Fathers, God of Son, God of Holy. The great, the closest thing to divine power was Lucifer's power. Now listen to this. 
The Desire of Ages, page 761, paragraph 5. What did I say? <laughs> okay. Say it again. The Desire of Ages, page 761, paragraph 5. Now, here's what it says. To him, as to no other created being, was given a revelation of God's love. He understood God's love like no other angel did, including Gabriel. The only other persons to understand God's love more fully would be the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's who we're dealing with. That's the being that came through the serpent. Now, <laughs> if that's how powerful he is, can you handle him? No, you can't. The only power that can handle Satan is God. And so this power comes. Let's keep reading more about him. Uh, thou seedest of the sum, verse 12 of uh, Ezekiel 28, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, read verse 13. Read for me. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. Let me show you something else. <laughs> Let me take this off. This is, a, this is interesting stuff. Let's read those stones off again. The sardius... Topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, so why? Jasper, sapphire, I think sapphire has two Ps. What else? Emerald, carbuncle, my handwriting is deteriorating as I write, and Gold. Now, that's Lucifer's covering. You know, a crocodile has scales and a lizard. Lucifer had precious stones. Can you imagine what it was like to see him flying through heaven? <laughs> now, go to verse 14. Read it for me. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Now, I told you about, go to, don't lose Ezekiel 28, go to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. This is God giving Moses instructions to make the ark and the mercy seat. Now we're looking at the, the construction of the mercy seat. Read verse 17. Of Exodus 25. And thou shalt do what? Mercy seat of? Uh -huh, a cubit and a half. Two cubits and a half, the length of a cubit and a half. The Now, read verse 18. Ah, uh, stop. Thou shalt make what? What's the plural word? Cherubims. Now go back to Ezekiel 28. Read verse 14. What does it say? Thou art the anointed cherub, not cherubim. In other words, keep reading, and I have set thee so. You see, here was the ark, and there were angels on either side that covered the ark. As God's divine bodyguards, I guess. But apparently, originally, Lucifer was the one. Because the Bible says, you are the anointed cherub. God doesn't need bodyguards. But Lucifer was hand he was made for this work to be closer to God than any other angel. You are the anointed cherub that covereth, I have set you so. Read verse 15. Thou was perfect in the, thy ways from the day that thou wast. Ah, he was created. <laughs> A created being. Then who made him? 
Come on, be specific. Who created him? Christ. Everything was made by Christ. Christ created Lucifer. Now, these are the stones on Lucifer. Go to Exodus 28. Look at the stones on the high priest. Whom does the high priest represent? Jesus Christ. All right. Ezek, uh, sorry, Exodus 28. We read from verse 17. We're describing now the breastplate which has stones on it. Okay. That's Lucifer. Let's describe the high priest who represents Christ. Someone read verse 17. Uh huh. Rows of stones. Mm -hmm. Stop. The first row shall be the sardius. Go on. The second row. The, uh, the, the second stone. Topaz, carbuncle. All right, hold on. Let me scribble down. Of course, carbuncle goes from way down here to here, but it's the same stone. Next row. Emerald. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Have mercy on me. A sapphire. Uh huh. And a diamond. Go on. Third row. Liger. Agate. Oh, sorry. Put agate down here. Agate, uh-huh, and an amethyst. I hope you know what these words are. Next, the fourth row. Beryl, onyx, jasper. And they are in settings of what? Gold. So let's put gold over here. Now, look closely what we're dealing with. Who is this? Come on, who's this? Who's this? The high priest representing whom? Christ. Now, Lucifer has the Sardis. Does Jesus have that? The high priest? Yes. The Topaz, the high priest? Yes. The diamond, the high priest? Yes. The uh, beryl, the high priest? Yes. The onyx, the high priest? Yes. The jasper, the high priest? Yes. The uh, sapphire? Where's the sapphire? Here. The emerald? Where's the emerald? Where is he? Here. The carbuncle? Where's the carbuncle? Uh, where is he? Oh, here. Okay. Gold? Over there. The only three Lucifer doesn't have is the liger, the agate, and the amethyst. Okay. Because you can't have... Christ has to have something more than you. Are you following me? Okay. okay. Now, you look at that. Now, use your imagination. We're dealing with the power that came in the garden. That's before he sinned, you see. Here comes Lucifer and all these stones. Here's the high priest representing Christ. Let's say Christ has his stones. What do you notice about the two of them? They look alike. You have to look close to, this, to decide what? Now they're different. Yes, you have to look close to realize, wait a minute, one has three extra. Of these 14 stones, or 13, he has 10. They looked like two peas in a pod. Lucifer looked just like Christ. Lucifer was closest to Christ. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set this. So I made you, I handpicked you for a position. Stay right next to me. He was the one who decided, I want Christ's position. I'm not satisfied. I want Christ's position. Well, that can't happen because you can't be God. So he was thrown out. Go back to Revelation 12. Let's read verse 9. Revelation 12, verse 9. Read with me. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And this earth became his stomping ground. Now, Genesis 3, verse 1. We're learning about this power called Satan. We don't want to focus on him. We focus on Christ, but we must be aware of him. 
All right, let's read again. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, what does that tell you about Satan coming through the serpent? Were there cows in the garden? Were there leopards in the garden? Were there elephants? Why did he come through the serpent? It was the smartest. Are some animals smarter than others? Have you ever seen a lizard in a circus? <laughs> Have you ever seen a crocodile in a circus? What do you see? An elephant, a seal, a, a, a orca, you know, these intelligent animals. Satan chose the most intelligent animal and worked through him. And beautiful at the same time. Because you see, the serpent did not crawl until sin. Because of sin, it was told to crawl. Verse 14 of Gen and 15, 15 of Genesis 3. But the serpent didn't crawl. There are serpents in Southeast Asia, Indonesia being one of them, that glide from tree to tree. They don't literally fly, but they glide. They jump from one tree and glide to another tree or glide to the floor. Yes, there are lizards that do that. So the serpent did not crawl, we believe it flew, but it was beautiful. So Satan chose the most beautiful and the most intelligent. We are dealing with an enemy that is strategic and knows how to come at you with such force that unless you have divine power at your aid, you cannot overcome and resist him. But, let me take this off. Notice how he came at Eve. We're in Genesis 3. What did he say in verse 1? Read verse 1. Come on, read verse 1. Don't take all day. He said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. What is he doing? He's questioning. Go to Matthew 4. Matthew 4, let's read from verse 1. Do you have that? Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Read with me. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said what? If thou be the Son of God. Stop. Why would he say if? Go to the previous chapter, chapter 3. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. Read 16, 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him. Next verse. And lo, a voice from heaven saying what? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What did the voice call Jesus? My beloved Son. Of course, that's the Father. Because the Holy Ghost was on his shoulder in the form of a dove. So we have three, by the way. Anyway. The devil comes six weeks later. You know, 40 days, 40 nights, that's 6, 7, 42. This is about six weeks. If you're the son of God. But the devil heard when the father said, you are my son. What does Satan try to do to you regarding God's word? Doubt it. Doubt is not the same thing as saying it's not true. Doubt means, eh, I'm not sure I can believe this. I don't think I can believe this. Satan knows that the grass was made by the word of God. He saw it made. So he doesn't come and say, this is not true. There's too much evidence. He just introduces doubt. Can God really save me? Doubt. When I say, I'm sorry, Father, did he really forgive me? And so doubt tortures you. You see, an outright disbelief in God brings a kind of a carnal peace of mind. 
Are you with me? But when you doubt the word, you are tortured. Did, I, did he forgive me? Can I conquer this weakness? Does he really love me? And doubt tortures. The enemy in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, he attacks the word of God and leads us to doubt. That's the enemy of Christ. But here's what will happen to him when Christ comes back. Go to uh, Revelation 20. Let's read from verse 1. And we'll move off this unpleasant subject of Satan and move to something more cheery and happy. Revelation 20, let's read from verse 1. Let's pause. Let me say a prayer. Father in heaven, I've gone too long without praying. I'm sorry about that. Forgive me if I said anything I should not have said. Now strengthen me through your spirit of truth that angels stand next to me and next to my friends. Teach us, they God. Bless those listening via the internet. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Revelation 20, reading verse 1, what does it say? And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless spit and a great chain in his hand. Carefully now, verse 2, and he... Stop. He laid on our home. Keep reading that old, which is the... And where did we come across those four names? Revelation 12, 9. Mm -hmm. They just repeated. And cast them into the bottom of the spit. So now, there's coming a time when the devil will be restricted severely. And we can't get into that now. That's the, the millennium period. But go to verse 10. Read for me. And the devil, that what? This, now stop. Now, we said, we saw four names for the devil. Dragon means he does what? This rise. Serpent means he does what? Deceives. Satan means he does what? He accuses and opposes. Devil means he's an adversary and enemy. Look at verse 10. See which one is used. Come on, read the verse for me. And the serpent that deceived them, because this is his primary weapon, not destruction, because as he tries to destroy the church physically, members multiply. And the devil that deceived them. Go back to verse 9 of Revelation 12. Revelation, 9, Revelation 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. What are the next few words? Which deceiveth. That's the quality of the serpent the Bible stresses. He deceives. All right, let's read verse 10 of Revelation 20. And the dragon that deceived him was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. In other words, there is coming a day when the devil will be destroyed by fire. Go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. The parable of the sheep and the goats. The sheep are on the right hand of God. And here's what the king says to the sheep in verse 34 of Matthew 25. Do you have that? Read for me. What does it say? Then shall the king say unto them in his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now pause. The kingdom of God, where we'll go if we obey God, has been prepared for us. For how long? From the foundation of the world. Go now to what the king says to sinners who oppose him. Read verse 41. Uh-huh. To them on his. Uh-huh. Part from me, ye curse, come on, into everlasting fire, prepared. Where did we come across the word prepared before? In verse 34. Do you see it? You see the word prepared in verse 34? But we have prepared in 41. Heaven was prepared for whom? Well, who except Christ? For us. Verse 41 tells us something was prepared. What's that? Fire. For whom? Uh-huh. One day he'll be destroyed. And his angels. But not only the devil and his angels. 
Who else will be in the fire? Those who choose to follow his way. But notice the mercy of God. God didn't prepare hell for people. He prepared it for the devil and his angels. What God prepared for people, according to verse 34, is heaven, not hell. But why will there be people in hell? They will not obey God. And he has no choice but to send them where he sends the devil. Because ultimately, a person who disobeys God is functioning with the same mind as the devil and gets the same punishment. That power in Genesis 3, the serpent, was the enemy of Christ, Satan himself. There is a power in the universe called Satan. His business is to draw us from God. Here's how he does it. Go back to Genesis 3 and see if his technique is working in your life. And I hope your answer is no. Genesis 3, we read 4, 5, and 6. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now listen to 5 carefully. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, stop. How, how else can you say in the day ye eat? Yes, but in the day ye eat, take out eat, put something else. In the day ye sin. Mm -hmm. Because God said, don't eat it. <laughs> in the day ye sin. Now keep reading. Your eyes shall be open. Come on. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, what? look at this. Look at these three things. Your eyes open. You shall be like God. You shall know good, in other words, and evil. Now, is there any other kind of knowledge? It's all good or evil, which means you'll know everything. Do you follow me? If you know good and evil, you know everything. Look at the judgment. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil or bad. That's it too. The devil says, your eyes shall be open. You shall be like God. You'll know everything. <laughs> what do you call those? The devil is saying you will receive what? If you sin. Mm -hmm. Do you know people believe that? God said, sin eventually leads to death. The devil said, sin has benefits. Now, <laughs> there's a, I believe I'm correct in saying, a few years ago, many years ago, there was a, a move in Canada to put cigarettes in black and white boxes. And cigarette people rose up in arms and, because who will buy a box of cigarettes if it's in a black and white box? It's not attractive. You see, packaging, if you're studying business, or packaging is absolutely important. For those of you who fly on plane, next time you take a flight, look at the magazine in the seat pocket in front of you and go to the back. You know, you buy things on the plane, perfume, whatever. And look at the bottles in which the alcohol is placed. See how artistic they look. Are you following me? As though designed by Michelangelo. And Renoir. And some great painter from Melbourne. They're just beautiful. But what's in that bottle? Cirrhosis of the liver. Loss of your faculties. A car accident. <laughs> That's what's in the bottle. But you don't put a wrecked car on the car. <laughs> Who'll want it? So packaging. The devil packages sin. If you run around with all the women, you'll be the man of Melbourne. Or you'll be the woman of Melbourne. If you smoke, you look cool. If you take drugs, ah, you'll be the life of the party. 
This is how he preached. God said you're going to die. The devil said, no, 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 no. You live. You'll know everything. You'll be just like God. God says sin makes us like the devil. The devil says sin makes us like God. And most people believe that. All right. We've talked about Christ, who is the creator. We've talked about the word of God, which is absolutely reliable. It, is, it has the life of God, the character of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. It, it's, just, it's a creative thing. It is precise. Then we talked about this great enemy called the devil, who is very real. And he has assistants who all used to be holy angels, unfallen. But they followed him, and they will get what he gets when Christ comes again, the second and the third time. We're going to move from Christ in a certain way. The word Satan. Let's move to this absolutely central feature of the Bible called righteousness. Go back to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, and we go to 2 Peter 3 after that. Hebrews 1, we read verse uh, 9, verse 8. We're looking at righteousness. What is it? Hebrews 1, let's read verse 8. Read it with me. But under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. The symbol of your kingdom is righteousness. What's the symbol of Australia? A what? A kangaroo? All right. And of course, it has a flag. The symbol of the United States is the eagle. We have a flag. The symbol of Christ's kingdom is righteousness. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Okay, now go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, we'll read from 10 to 13 so that we can make connections. 2 Peter 3, 10 to 19. Not to 19, sorry. 10 to 13. When you found that, say amen. amen. Read with me, what does it say? But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Keep reading. Seeing then that all these things shall be, mm -hmm, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all what? Holy conversation and godliness. Keep reading. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of, keep reading, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Now, read verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth... Mm -hmm. Now, let's pause on that. <laughs> we have heaven... We have new earth. What's the central lifestyle in heaven? Righteousness. What is the leading quality on earth as God desires it? Righteousness. Now, listen to Hebrew. Don't go, just listen. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Righteousness is what Christ gives us through the work of the gospel. That's why the work of saving a man is called what? Righteousness, come on, by faith. Or also justification by faith, same thing. Righteousness by faith is the central teaching of the Bible. It's centered in Christ. We have to look at righteousness from Genesis. Let us go to Genesis 4. 
But no, don't go to Genesis 4 yet. Let's go to Genesis 2. And then we go to 3. And I hope by now you're developing a little affection for the book of Genesis. A little affection. Now, read verses 16 and 17 of chapter 2. Are you ready? Read with me. Now the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Stop. Freely eat. Keep reading. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Stop. Finish it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Listen to me carefully. God is telling Adam, there's something you can do, and there's something you shouldn't do. He didn't say in the day you think. Don't do it. Yes, we know sin originates in the heart. We know that. But we take that so far, we think that everything is in the heart. Once it is there or not there, everything is okay. Don't eat it or eat it. God said, don't eat it. If you don't eat it, you'll be okay. If you eat it, you're in trouble. Don't do something or it is a doing. Okay. We know Adam sinned. Go to verse, uh, let's read from verse 9 of chapter 3. Read with me. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, because I was afraid, and I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Stop. Did you do something? That's God's question. Did you do something that I told you, finish it for me, not to do? Did you do what I told you not to do? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. God said, Who told you you're naked? You did something. Go to verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened, you did something. Hmm? The voice of thy wife, keep reading, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. You did something. Contrary to my word, you did something. Now, let's go to Genesis 4. Read from verse 1, read with me. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Keep reading. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Question for you, did Cain do something? Come on, did he do something? What did he do? He brought an offering of fruit. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. Did Cain do something? Did Abel do something? Yes. All right. What did Cain do? Cain, he brought plants. Fruit, durian, that's what he brought. Now, Abel, <laughs> he brought a lamb. Both of them did something. Just didn't think of, they did something. Now, read verse 5 for me. No, read verse 4. Of the first link of his flock, and of the fat thereof. Now very carefully. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Keep it, stop. What do you understand by that? The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. What, what did I keep emphasizing? Abel did something. Come on. Cain did something. Now read. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. What did God respect? What Abel did. God said, oh, okay, he did the right thing. I respect that. 
Not only what he did, I respect him. Look at the verse again. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. God can accept what you do and reject you. You go along with what you do. Now read verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very rough and his countenance fell. Now, Cain did something. And what did God do? He rejected it. Abel did something. What did God do? He accepted it. Now listen to God. God is so reasonable. I like God. Nice fellow. Now listen to God in 6 and 7. Read for me. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? Keep reading. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Stop. Accepted by whom? By God. On the basis of what? Doing what's right. <laughs> if you do well, what I want, as Abel did, I'll accept you. When you do what God says, here's how God describes it. Go now to 1 uh, John chapter 3. Let's see how the Bible describes what Abel did and what Cain did. 1 John 3 verse 11 and verse 12. Do you have that? Towards the back of the Bible, 1 John. You can start from Revelation and work your way up. If you're having a little difficulty, 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Now we go hundreds of years, thousands of years later, we're getting a commentary on what Abel and Cain did and how the Bible describes their actions. Do we have verse 11 of chapter 3 of 1 John? Read with me. What does it say? For this is the message that you heard from the beginning that you should love one another. Now carefully, not as, don't be like Cain, who was of that wicked one. Stop. What does that mean, of that wicked one? He was a child of the devil. Now, why was he a child of the devil? Keep reading. And slew his brother. Keep reading. And wherefore, why did he kill him? Go on. Because his... Uh-huh. Ah, uh, wait a minute now. His own works were evil. But what information do we have about Cain's works? What is all the Bible tells us? He brought plants. That was his work. What does the Bible tell us about Abel's works? He brought an animal. Now, which one represents Christ? <laughs> what does that tell you about Abel? He understood he had a need for Christ. Cain did not feel a need for Christ. Now, how does the Bible describe what Abel did? Look at verse 12. Righteous. Then what is righteousness? What's righteousness? Right doing. How does the Bible describe what Cain did? Evil. Righteousness is doing what God says to do. Let's go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Remember, when I get excited and go quickly, tell me, slow down, please. I don't want to be in Melbourne and you in Tasmania. We must be in the same place. All right. What book did I say? Matthew, what chapter? 23, reading from verse, let's read a, a lot of verses, from verse 29. You don't lose by reading the Bible. We don't read it enough. Are you there? Let's pray again. Father in heaven, as we read, let the spirit of truth guide our minds into truth, dear God, I pray. And as we see truth, give us a willingness to obey that truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Read with me. Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrite, for ye build the tomb of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. In other words, they would kill prophets in the Old Testament, then build nice tombs for them. You understand what I'm trying to say? Very nice tomb, we'll kill you because you don't like the message you brought from God, but we give you a nice burial. All right. So that's what the verse is saying. Verse 30, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. In other words, the Pharisees in the days of Jesus, Jesus is saying, that's what you say. We didn't kill anybody. We were not there with our fathers. But crisis has a surprise for them. 
Verse 31. Wherefore, ye be what? Witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the pro Christ. Saying there's no difference between you and your forefathers. You didn't do it physically, but you have the same attitude. So you're just as guilty. Verse 32. Fill up there then the measure of your fathers. You're just as guilty. Verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how shall ye escape the damnation of hell? Now verse 34 carefully. Wherefore behold, come on, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. Now pause. You notice something interesting? It's a digression. What did Jesus say? Wherefore behold what? I send unto you. Who sent the prophet Samuel in the days of the Old Testament? Christ. Who sent Isaiah? Christ. Who sent Jeremiah? Christ. Christ says, I send unto you. Not some, all prophets and wise men and scribes. Keep reading. Some of whom you shall cruel, kill, and crucify. And some of them shall ye scourge in your what? Synagogues and persecute from city to city. Now carefully, that upon you may come what? All the what? Righteous blood. Stop. What is righteous blood? The blood of? A righteous person. Yeah. Good people get killed. For God. Let me say it again. Good people get killed for God that upon you may come all the righteous blood, keep reading with me, shed upon the earth. Keep reading now. From the blood of... Stop. What does Jesus call Abel? Righteous. righteous. But what is the only information we have about Abel? He brought the right thing. You don't have anything else? Well, we have he raised sheep. But he wasn't accepted by God because you were a sheep. He was accepted because he brought one. So Christ calls him righteous. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Beautiful chapter, Hebrews 11. Let's read verse 4 of Hebrews 11. When you found it, say amen. Read with me. What does it say? By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Keep reading. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Stop. What do you understand by he obtained witness that he was righteous? If he gets a witness that he's righteous, what happened? Somebody saw what he did and said what? That's a righteous. Who said that? Finish the verse. God testifying of his gift stop. Who was the witness to Abel's righteousness? God. Now if God rejected Cain and Abel was righteous, Cain was evil. And we read that in 1 John 3.12. God calls obedience righteousness. What is righteousness? Simple obedience to what God says. You know, theologians and Christians who like to get around obedience, they find clever ways to describe righteousness. No, it is pure and simple obedience to God's word. Let's go to Deuteronomy 6. Book number 5, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's read verse 25 of Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6 verse, what did I say? No, Deuteronomy 6 verse 25. Oh, okay, all right, all right. I thought I said 25, 6. Okay, Deuteronomy 6 verse 25. Do you have that? Read with me. What does it say? And what? Read carefully. And it shall be what? Our righteous stop. What will be our righteousness? Keep reading. If we observe to do, come on, all these commandments, come on, before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. What is righteousness? Obedience to the law of God or the word. This is our righteousness. If we do. Now, let's look at the law of God. 
as we talk about righteousness. Go to Romans 7. The commandments of God. Romans 7. Let's read verse 12 and we'll read verse 14. We're looking at central doctrines of the Bible all rooted in Genesis. Romans 7, read verse 12. What does the Bible say? Romans 7, verse 12. Okay. Wherefore the law is? And the commandment, holy, just, and good. How do you describe the commandments? Holy, just, and good. Now, the Bible says God is holy. The Bible says God is just. The Bible says God is good. <laughs> now, what does that tell you? If the law is these things, what is the law? It is as sacred, finish my words, as God himself. Read verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. Stop. Well, go on. But I am carnal, sold under sin. Now, the law is spiritual. The law is holy. The law is just. The law is good. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law is perfect. The law is as sacred as God himself. Now, if God tells me obey this law, I need help. Are you with me? Because the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal. So that righteousness, we must add to the definition of righteousness. Righteousness is doing God's will by the power of Christ. Because you cannot keep a divine law in a human nature. You can't do it. Righteousness is doing God's will by the indwelling power of Christ. All right. We talked about Satan. We talked about righteousness. What have you learned? Whenever I say what have you learned, you ask questions. I'll ask for questions later. What have you learned? <laughs> Where's my sister who's up here? What have you learned so far? Satan was as close to Christ as any other being could be. He was deliberately made that way as near as possible. The only reason why Satan wasn't equal with God is because you cannot make God. But as close as a, as a created being can be, Satan was that close to being just like God. A remarkable thing. That's why it's such a tragedy that he fell. How can you be so close to God and betray him? All right, what else did you learn? Come on, move quickly. Move. The biggest lie of Satan is that he does not exist. <laughs> Satan will have you believe he does not exist. Or if he exists, he has a tail and horns and he's half animal, half man. Mm -mm. Satan is intelligent. He has lost none of his intelligence. As a matter of fact, all the power he had before he sinned, he still has. Hmm? Towards the yeah, towards it, yeah. He still has and he uses it for evil. What else have you learned? Oh, say that again. Sin, sin has That's what the devil tells you. Sin has benefits. And most people believe that. Now, sin has pleasure. It has no benefits. But Moses decided not to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He preferred to suffer God's people. Sin has pleasure. It has no benefits. Someone else, what did you learn? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. The devil make when you sin, you look like God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jeez, in other words, calling God a sinner. What did you learn? Uh, righteousness is simple obedience to God. Righteousness, simply put, is obedience to what God says. But by what power? The indwelling power of Christ, because God's law is a divine standard. No human being can keep it without help. So. Obeying the Sabbath requires divine help. Now you can stay away from work on Saturday, but that's not Sabbath keeping. Sabbath keeping means rest of body and soul. And according to Matthew eleven thirty, 30, only Christ can give us rest for the soul. So we need divine power to keep a divine law. Righteousness is plain and simply doing what God says. 
Go to Romans 5. Since you're still thinking about what you learned. Romans 5. Read verse 19. No, 18 and 19. And I'm going to show you something. I like to put up these, what I call formulas. We have two sides and see if they're balanced. Romans 5, 18 and 19. I will extract some words and then ask for your comments. All right, Romans 5, read verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, stop. We have offense. Uh-huh, go on. Judgment came upon all to condemnation of life. So the offense led to condemnation. Go on. Even so, the righteousness of one, so we have righteousness, go on, of one, the free gift came upon to justification of life, and so we have life. Okay, what's the offense? Adam's sin. What's the result? Condemnation. That's why Christ has to come and deliver us from the condemnation. What did Christ do? His righteousness is the reason why we can be justified, justification of life. So the opposite of the offense is righteousness. Are you with me? The opposite of condemnation is life. Now, look at verse 19. Read that one for me. For as by one man, disobedience, okay, pause. Go on. Many were made. Okay, pause. We have sinners. Go on. So by thee. Ah, obedience. Uh huh. Go on. Righteous. Okay. Now look at that. You're all very brilliant people. Let me come over here so I don't block these two handsome men. Okay. This leads to that. This leads to that. This leads to that. This leads to that. Those two verses are saying virtually the same thing using different words. This is 18. This is 19. Now, let me see if you're focusing. What is the equivalent of this in verse 19? Disobedience. Yes, this goes with that. Are you following me? Now, what's the equivalent of this? Sinners, mm -hmm, this and this, same thing. What's the equivalent to this? Obedience. What's the equivalent to this? What's the equivalent to this? Life. Righteousness is life. You don't believe the Bible. All right. It's my fault. Let's try it a different way. Go to Galatians chapter 3. <laughs> it's my fault. Galatians chapter 3. Let's look at righteousness as life again. You know, it's a lifestyle of obedience. That's all it is. What did God say? I'll do it. Where does he want me to go? I'll go. How high does he want me to jump? I'll jump. Where does he want me to sit? I'll sit. Righteous living. What he wants, I do. And I do it gladly. Galatians 3. Galatians 3, one of my favorite books, Galatians. Let's read from verse 19. Read with me, what does it say? Wherefore then serveth the law, come on, because of transgression, come on. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and was by, by angels in the hand of a mediator. Verse 20. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Now this is the verse 21. Read on. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. Now read carefully. For if there had been a law given. Uh -huh. Stop. If there had been a law that could give life. Then righteousness, come on, should have been by the law. Now, wait a minute. Righteousness by the law. 
But if you look at that carefully, listen again. If there had been a law that could give life, righteousness should be by the law. If, let me say it again, if there had been a law that could give life, what he should put here, what he should put over here is not righteousness, but life should be by the law. But he doesn't say life, he says righteousness. Because righteousness is life, God's life. If there had been a law given that could give life, then life would be by the law. Instead of life, he puts righteousness. Because righteousness is a lifestyle of total obedience to God's will from the heart. It's not force. It is a joyful service to God. Whatever God says, I do. Now, if Cain had had that attitude, he would not have been condemned by God. My brothers and sisters, don't let anyone complicate it for you. Righteousness, the key to defining righteousness is bound up in the very first syllable. It is doing what is right. And what is right is defined by the law of God. Now, if Cain had brought an animal, it would have been a righteous act. Of course, let me add, not just bring it, bring it from the heart, you see. He didn't. And so very simply, listen to what God said to Cain. Go back to Genesis 4. Let's read verse 7, verse 6 and 7. See how reasonable God is. God gives us a chance, more than a chance, to be saved. More than a chance. And the Lord said unto Cain, verse 6, read with me, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt what? Rule over him. God said, look, if you do what's right, I'll accept you. If you don't, I'll reject you. And sin will have you. Righteousness is doing what is right by the power of Christ. Go to Isaiah. No, let's go to uh, Romans 8. Romans 8. And I'll move on to a big subject. Romans 8. Let's read from verse 1. Do you have that powerful book by the great apostle Paul, Romans 8, reading from verse 1? Read with me. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now we have flesh and spirit, okay? What does walk mean? Abide, give me another word. Live. You live by the flesh and spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Keep reading. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now read that last section carefully, verse 4. Come on. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Go on. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Listen to verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be what? Fulfilled in us. Now pause. Here's the law. That's the law. The Bible says the righteousness of the law must be fulfilled in us. Give me another word for fulfilled as I make this motion. Expressed in us. Because it was in Christ, in our same flesh. Now, that the righteousness of the law might be... Now, notice how Christ came. For what the law could not do it, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, the same flesh. 
condemn sin in the flesh. How did he condemn it? He showed by his life, you don't have to live a life of sin. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. And this happens when the law is placed where? Mm -hmm. That's the only way. That's the new covenant, which is the only covenant that saves. That's how Abraham was saved. Yes, the Bible mentions the old and the new. Only the new saves. Abraham was saved by this covenant. It's called new because it was ratified by the blood of Christ. This is what God wants from us. This was not in the heart of Cain. It was in the heart of Abel. Righteousness is just right doing. But to do right, God wants us to love it just because it's right. Not because there's a benefit, monetary, monetary benefit or some romantic benefit, simply because it is right. And it can only be right if it originates with God. Righteousness. So the Bible says, in heaven, the new earth, it's all righteousness. The sept of Christ's kingdom, all righteousness. That's it. Only a righteous person will be admitted to God's kingdom. And Christ, yes, my good pastor. Um, on, on that note, um, I'd like to invite you in. Um, I'm sure that uh, you're, you're doing enough rest. Oh, yes, yeah. What time is it? Uh, uh, oh, five after three? All right, yeah, that's fine. Is anyone dying? No, no. All right, okay, okay. Let's, let's, let's move on because sometimes you shouldn't break something. But thank you, pastor. God bless you. God bless you. All right. Any questions on righteousness? Uh huh. They were still, they just naked. You see, they covered. The, let's go to Genesis 3. Thank you. We read from verse uh, 7 of Genesis 3. Well, before we go there, let's go to Revelation 16. Then we come back to Genesis 3. Revelation 16. We go from book 1 to book 66. The Bible is the most powerful book on the face of the earth. It really is. All right, what chapter did I say? What verse? 15. When you found it, say Amen. Now, I want you to read carefully as you keep in mind what our sister asked about the fig leaves of, uh, that Adam and Eve made to cover themselves, yet they still felt naked. All right. Read verse 15 for me. What does it say? Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Now, what is that garment Christ is telling us to keep? Go to Revelation 19, read verse 8. Read verse 8 for me of Revelation 19. And to her was given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and for the fine linen of the saints is the righteousness of Christ. Now, keeping in mind this uh, a covering is a symbol of Christ's righteousness, we go back to verse 15 of chapter 16 and it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. Because if you lose that, what condition you're in? Naked, no matter what else you put on. Once you lose that, you're naked. Now, keep this in mind, go to Genesis 3. It is only the righteous robe of Christ that keeps us from nakedness. Everything else does not work. Let's read from verse 7 of Genesis 3. Are you there? Read with me. What does it say? And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, now that's physical nakedness, you see. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, why did they cover themselves? They were ashamed. Read verse 25 of chapter 2. 
Come on, read it for me. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and what? They were not ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? There was no sin. There was no sin. They had no consciousness of nakedness. No sin. Now in chapter, in verse 7, they're aware of their nakedness. So they're covering the physical body. Are you with me? Verse 8, read for me. Verse 8, or Genesis 3, sorry. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, they hid even though they were covered. Verse 7 says, they knew that they were naked, they covered themselves. Verse 8 said, they still hid behind the trees. So we have the aprons and then we have trees trying to cover these two people. Verse 9, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? What did he say? I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. But by now he is covered. But he still considers himself naked. Because spiritually, only the righteous covering of Christ can handle nakedness. So Adam and Eve was naked in the eyes of God, despite the physical covering of leaves. Until the righteousness of Christ covers us, we are exposed. What did they do? All right, the sisters, what did they do? What did they do? What did they do? What does verse 6 say? And when the woman see, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, did God say don't eat, yes or no? Yes. So when they both partake of the fruit, they both what? So they sin now. And they're trying to deal with that. They cover themselves. It doesn't work. Now go to verse 21. Read for me. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, what does that clothing represent? Righteousness of Christ. How do we know that? Go to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah 3. You see, salvation is symbolized by the removal of one covering and the, the, the application of another. And you have to put text to text to text to see that. Zechariah 3, reading from verse 1. Do you have that? You found Zechariah? It's find Matthew. Then work your way back to Zechariah, not Matthew, Saul, Malachi. Well, you can find Matthew, then Malachi, then Zechariah. It's okay. Zechariah 3, we read from verse 1. Do you have that? Read with me. What does it say? And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing where? At his right hand to resist him. Keep reading. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a what? A what? Brand plucked out of the fire. Now read verse 3. Now Joshua was what? Clothed with filthy garments. Stop. Where do we first meet filthy garments? <laughs> the aprons of leaves. That's why Christ removed them. Now listen, let's go back to 3 of Zechariah 3. Now Joshua was what? Clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Read verse 4 carefully. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying what? Take away the filthy garments from him. Go on. And unto him he said, Behold, cause thine iniquity to pass from thee, and will clothe thee with change of raiment. So the removing of the filthy garments represents what? The removal of sin. Now, let's apply that to Adam and Eve. You see, the righteousness of Christ is not to cover sin or to conceal sin. When Adam and Eve came to God, because they had to have come to him finally, he had to remove the aprons of leaves and cover them with the righteousness of Christ. Let me show you something now. Since I'm dealing with this, I want you to look very carefully at Genesis 3, verse 7. All right, read that for me. Come on, read Genesis 3, 7. Stop. The eyes of? 
The eyes of who? Them. What's the next word? Both. All right. Call. Keep reading. We're open. Keep reading. And they stop. Let me write they. Keep reading. We have they again. Uh huh. We have they again. Uh huh. Come on, read. For, I want to hear you. May themselves. Hold on, hold on. Let me spell selves. All right. Mm -hmm. Go on. May themselves. May themselves aprons. So look at what we have. We have them. Who's them? Who's both? Who's they? Who's they? Who's they? Who's themselves? Who's missing? God. God is missing. Look at verse 21. Read for me. Come on unto. Stop. Hold on. Hold on. Don't rush the preaching. Unto Adam. Go on. Wife. Uh-huh. Uh, we have Lord. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We have courts, not just one, but two. Uh-huh. Now, let's look at these. My marker's dying. We have Adam. We have the wife. We have God. We have courts. We have clothed them. What do you observe about verse 21? Uh, sister, you're a nice person. God bless you. What do we have in verse 21? And verse 20. What's similar in 8, not 8, 7, that's in verse 21? Ah, okay, that's, the, we have, we have the, how many aprons were made in verse 7? Look at the Bible. How many aprons were made in verse 7? Is the word apron or aprons? Aprons. So we have more than one, at least two. Oh, this is just as dead as a... <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's my fault. I'm not using it well. All right. Here you we have aprons. One for Adam. One for Eve. That they made. Now, look at verse 21. We still want righteousness. How many courts do we have? Two. We have courts. One for Adam, here's Ad, unto Adam and to his wife, two coats. This time the Lord made it. In verse 7, they made it. In verse 7, they clothed themselves. In verse 21, God clothed them. Only God can deal with your sins. Only God can remove sin. Only God can apply the righteousness of Christ. But you must allow him. So somewhere between hiding in verse 8, they eventually came to Christ. By the way, the animal killed was not killed by God. It was killed by Adam. And you're saying to me, explain that and show me in the Bible. <laughs> Go to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus 1. Uh, Leviticus 1. We're looking at righteousness. There's a big subject I want to get to. I'll get to it, Lord willing. You have Leviticus 1. Let's read from verse 1. But before we read, let us say another little prayer. As soon as we settle down, I'll pray. All right, let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, this subject is very, very important. Righteousness and the application of that righteousness of Christ to the sinner. Speak through me, direct my mind, bless us with truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Leviticus 1, we try to identify who killed the animal. Because if you have coats of skin, the Bible is specific, coats of skin. It could have just said coats. We have aprons of leaves. Leaves don't bleed. We have coats of skin. Where did the skin from? A living thing. Leviticus 1, reading from verse 1. Read with me. 
And the Lord God called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, What? Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, he shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. Stop. God says, Look, if you come unto me, bring cattle, herd, flock. Cattle meaning domesticated animals, herd meaning cows, bulls, flock meaning sheep and goats. Now, verse 3. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of a congregation before the Lord. Now read verse 4. And he shall do what? Place his hand upon the head of the... And shall... Mm -hmm. Now what does that uh, mean that he... Who is he? The person, not the priest. If you read that entire chapter, you have he and you have the priest. Who does the priest represent? Who does the he represent? The sinner. He shall place his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. Now, read verse 5. And he shall do what? Kill the burnt offering. Yes. He. That's the sinner. Keep reading. And the priest, Aaron's son, shall take, break the blood, uh huh, round about the altar that is by the tab door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, he kills it, the priest takes the blood and applies it because Christ applies his blood, but he died because of sin. And so we go back to the garden. It was Adam that slew that animal, not God. But God made the coats of skins because we cannot produce the righteousness required. It is made entirely in heaven. God made it. God clothed them. They made the aprons, clothed themselves. God removed that. Aprons, they were half covered. Coats, they were fully covered. Which, by the way, is an indication of how God views the way we should dress. Please be fully covered. Don't walk around in aprons and leaves. Cover yourself, please. Are you following me? But that's another story. Let me not get into that before you walk out in a stampede. Okay. All right. Anything else on righteousness before I move on? Yes, my good sister. In regards to practical sense, yes. how does one attain like, righteousness? How does one desire to walk? Mm -hmm. How does one obey? I know there's true God's Mm -hmm. How does one kind of day-to-day Through the word. Studied and obeyed. Let me give you that quotation again. Christ's object lesson. That's a very important question. Christ's object lessons, page 100, paragraph 1. Listen carefully. Then we look at the life of Christ. The scriptures are the great agency in the transformation of character. Christ prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. What is the process of sanctification? What is that? Well, the, cle the ongoing cleansing work in the life. You come to Christ, but you still have to grow. The things you have to leave off. A man who comes to Christ genuinely is not a man free from weaknesses and temptations. He needs to grow and grow and grow. The process is called sanctification as he distances himself from things he used to do. And Jesus prayed, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And Ellen White goes on to say, if studied and obeyed. The word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. Listen to Jesus in John 15, 3. Just listen. Now ye are clean through the word. Clean of what? Sin. Which I have spoken unto you. Listen again. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. This is the power. When this gets into us, it produces the right impulses. That's why Christ says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will. And people take that to say, oh, I can ask whatever I want. No, the word abiding in us is as a controlling principle. Then the word in us guides our impulses, guides our thinking, tells us how to pray, tells us what to ask for. This. And so Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word. That is why your first action on the rising must be to go to God's word. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you asked that question. Go to God's word, not make up the agenda for the church board. Go to God's word and get power for that day. And take it with you all during the day. The word of God is the power to do everything we need. It is that word in us that generates the right impulses. Every right impulse is from Christ. There is no other power than the word of God. Okay. Let's go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. Is anyone falling in love with Genesis yet? No. I'll be patient. I'll wait. Send me an email when you have fallen in love with it and let me know. All right. Genesis 1. Let's read verse 1. Uh, don't look at it. Just say it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, give me another word for created. He may give me another word. What did God do when he created? Yes, what did he do? What's that? Oh, let, let the Bible tell you. It will save a lot of time. Go to chapter 2, read from verse 1. <laughs> chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God did what? He ended what? How long did he work? Six days. Now listen to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What did he do? He worked. He worked, and he worked hard. Because the Bible says in Exodus 31, 17, he rested and was refreshed. All right. He worked. Let's go back to chapter 2, read from verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, what are we introduced to there? Sabbath rest. In the garden, Sabbath rest. And may God give me the right words because there is no commandment as important as the Sabbath commandment. None of the other nine are as important. They're all important. I said as important. You know, Jesus says, weightier matters of the law. The first commandment is, then there's a second, one higher than the other, but both important. Okay, let us recite chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 again. Start reading. Stop. We have seventh. Keep reading. God ended his work, which he had made. Go on. And he rested on the stop. We have seventh again. Now, I'm going to have you read that several times, so take a deep breath and get ready. All right. Keep reading. His work, which he had made. Go on. And God blessed the... Stop. We have seventh again. Keep reading. Stop. We have it. What is it? It's a pronoun, which represents what? A noun. So what is it representing? Seventh. Mm -hmm. uh, let me spell seventh properly. Keep reading. In it. What do we have again? It. Okay. So we have seventh again. Go on. Which God created and made. Now, one, two, three, four, five times. The day of rest is identified. Is the seventh one. Are you with me? Five times. Seventh, 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 seventh. Start reading again. Verse 2, go on. Stop, ended. Go on. Come on, go on. Rested, stop. Same thing as ended, go on. All his work, which he had made, go on. And God... Go on, bless the seventh day and why? Uh-huh. <clears throat> so we have rested again. Now three times we're told God rested. Ended is the same thing. 
Five times we're told which day. Three times we're told what God did. Are you following me? All right. Uh, let me take this section over here. Start reading again from verse 2. I'm going to stop you frequently. Please bear with me. Uh-huh. Stop. We have God. Go on. Ended what? So stop. We have his. What is his? Pronoun. Referring to whom? God. Okay. So on the seventh day, God ended. His work came on. Which he admitted. So we have he. Go on. We have he again. Uh-huh. From all? His work. Uh-huh. We have he. Go on. We have God. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He. Go on. His. Go on. God. How many times do we have a reference to God by name or by pronoun? Ten. In that small passage. Seven times we're told, five times we're told which day. Three times we're told what support God did. Ten times the superstar of the Sabbath is identified. Who's absent? Who's absent? Notice now, this is Genesis 2. There's no sin yet. Adam and Eve are absent. The Sabbath is not about us. It's about him. He is the central figure of the Sabbath. The Sabbath wasn't given to us to have picnics. It was given to us to glorify God. And we know which day. How many times does he have to tell you for you to get it? Seven, seven. Here's what he did. Let's read it again. Start again, verse 2. Stop. <laughs> Don't be angry with me, but I hope you can see something. Start again, and on the seventh day, what? Stop. His work. Go on. Mm-hmm. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. He had made. Go on. Stop. His work. He had made. Keep going. Uh-huh. 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 Stop. His work. Go on. So he had made. Now, let's look at that. Stop this side. What do we have here? 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 Now, I want you to think. What do you understand by his work which he had made? And it's repeated. Do Toyotas make cars? I mean, does Toyota make cars? Does Honda make cars? So both make cars. Are you following me? Okay. So Honda can't say we alone make cars. Toyota makes cars. Audi makes cars. BMW makes cars. His work, which he had made. Think. What does that mean? Well, yeah, but <laughs> let's come up with a grocery list of what you made. <laughs> Who else can do that? Nobody else. Not only is it his work, but it is a work he alone can do. No one else can do that but God. So his work, which he alone could do, his work, he alone can do. His work. The Sabbath is a celebration not only of what God did, 
but of the ability of God. God not only provided activity, God has ability. He alone can create. This work of creation is God's and no one else can do it. Let's read again. Start again. Verse 2. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh huh. So God blessed the day and he sanctified the day. So what things did God do? He rested on it. He blessed it. He sanctified it. What do we know? It is God, 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 God. What do we know? His work, his work, his work. But the kind of work only God can do. The Sabbath is a celebration not only of the fact that animals were made on the sixth day. The Sabbath celebrates that we have a God who can do what no one else can do. And that is create. Now God says to us, keep that day. Let's look at God's work. Itemize his work. What did God make on day three? Trees. trees. What kind of trees? Some of them. Fruit trees. What's that? Why would he make fruit trees? Food. We serve a God who can provide what? Food. Verse 9, chapter 1. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, let the dry land appear. And it was so, so God provided water. Verse 14, Genesis 1. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and season, days and years. Now God provided the sun, the moon, the stars. The sun, of course, being at a physical level, as we say, the source of life. We need the sun. Plants need the sun. Shut out the sun, nothing grows. We go back to Genesis 1, verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. The firmament, where we have oxygen and the gases that we need to breathe. How do we know that? Genesis 1, verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. And fowl that may fly above the earth. Where? In the open firmament. The flies, the birds fly in the firmament, not in outer space. That's where the air is for us, the firmament. So God provides water. He provides food. He provides air. Ella White says, Councils on Stewardship, page 17, we are indebted to him for the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe. The Sabbath is a celebration of the ability of our God to take care of us. So when you, your job is threatened because you want to keep the Sabbath, can your God take care of you? And you have to say yes or no. If you say no, you're calling God a liar. What does the Sabbath remind us of again? Let's look at the order in which creation was carried out. What was made on the very last day of creation, the very last thing God created, Adam, then Eve. What came before them? Food. What came before them? Water. What came before them? Air to breathe. What came before them? A place to live, the garden. What came before them? The companionship of animals. Then he made them. The Sabbath is a reminder that God provides before he brings us to a situation. 
A lot of people say, I can't keep the Sabbath. How will I eat? God already arranged that. How will I pay my rent? He has that arranged. God never brings you to a crisis and then tries to determine how will I fix it. He provides the solution and brings you to that solution as you obey him by faith. God provided everything Adam and Eve needed. Then he brought them into the garden. That's not only the way God works physically, that's the way God works spiritually. Go to John 6. John 6. Let's read from verse 1 of John 6. My second favorite book, John. <clears throat> read with me. After this, Jesus went over the sea of which is the sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up in the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. All right, verse 5. When Jesus, what? Lift up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him. He saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Stop. Now there's a crisis. Thousands of people have followed Christ into the wilderness to hear him. It's late. If you read that. It's the only miracle of Christ found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, and John 6. The only miracle found in all four Gospels. And Matthew and Mark will tell you it was night. It was late. The evening was coming on. They were in the desert place. So Jesus said, look, how are we going to feed these people? When shall we buy bread? It sounds as if they were stuck. Read verse 6. This he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. You look at the order of creation. We celebrate creation by the Sabbath. We serve a God who provides and then brings us to the situation. Now, Philip didn't know that. God had to test him. How will we feel? What did Philip say? 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them might take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Christ had it covered. Now, when God called you to obey him, believe he has provided a way for you to obey him. So while your knees are knocking in terror and dread and you're scared, God has provided a way. All we have to do is trust him. The Sabbath reminds us we serve a God who has everything provided. We just need to follow him in obedience. Go to Exodus 3. Let's read from verse 7. Exodus 3, reading from verse 7. Read for me, what does it say? The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. Come on. And I've heard their cries by reason of the taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Oh, I like that. Let me pause and digress. I like those three words, those four. I know their sorrows. God knows you need tuition. God knows your papers are not yet settled in the immigration office and you're scared of going back home without finishing your degree. God knows your sorrows. Beautiful verse. I know their sorrows. Now read verse 8. And I am? Stop. Look at those words again. So beautiful. Read again, verse 8. And I am? Calm down. I'm coming to help you. I'm come down now. Keep reading. To deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Come on. And to bring them up out of the land of Egypt. Read carefully now. Read again. To a, and to a good land. Come on. And a large. Come on. Ah. Now. God says I'm going to bring them to a land. What? 
flowing with milk and honey. God had the land marked out. But where were they? In Egypt. They had to cross what to get to the land? The wilderness. God had it laid out. Go to Ezekiel 20. Beautiful words. Ezekiel 20. Let's read from verse 6 of Ezekiel 20. Listen to God as he complains to Ezekiel about the, you know, the, the hard-heartedness of the men in his day. And he takes an example from the Israelites when God was about to bring them out of Egypt. Ezekiel 20. Let's read from verse 6. Ezekiel 20, reading from verse 6. Do you have that? Nice and clear and loud. Read with me. In the day when I, unto the, to bring them forth out of the, now carefully, keep reading, into a land that I had espied for them, go on, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Stop. God said, I not only selected the ideal location. It has everything they need. Because I spied it out. <laughs> Remember the spies that Joshua sent to look over Jericho? They took a look. They came back to him with a report after they were hidden by Rahab. Now here's God. He's his own spy. God said, I have spied out a land for them. Flowing with milk and honey. Now I have to lead them to it. I can't drag them to it. I have to lead them, and God leads us by our willing obedience. The Sabbath reminds us that God, you see, God spied out a beautiful land for world, and he made it. Then he made Adam and Eve and put them in it. Every Sabbath, you and I are to stop making a living for ourselves, which is really God, and rest in the confidence that it is not my position at Price Waterhouse Coopers that has me sustained, it is the goodness of God. Amen. And so God rested. On what day? The seventh day. From what? What he had done. Can yes. Can we cook on Sabbath? No. Yes, we can. You mean, should we cook on Sabbath? No. Mm -hmm. And that's another story. Read Exodus 16, verse 23 to 25. No. Now you can warm the food on Sabbath, but there's no cookie on Sabbath. Is it widespread among us? Yes. Were the Israelites rebellious? Yes. But we shouldn't cook on Sabbath. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. We should cook on Sabbath. And the dishes can wait until after sunset. Mm -hmm. You see, either you obey God or leave him alone. The partial obedience qualifies you for hell. If he says don't cook, don't cook. Oh yeah, but that's why I told him Exodus 16. <laughs> Listen to me, God who kept the food fresh from Friday to Sabbath in the wilderness, can keep it fresh today. Make it on Friday. And leave it over. <laughs> God hasn't changed. Don't cook. And if, if it means just eating sandwiches, make simple sandwiches. Stuff yourself during the week, but make simple sandwiches on the Sabbath. Don't cook. Disobedience prevents us from seeing the glory of God. All right, you always look so depressed to me. Okay. <laughs> All right, questions about the Sabbath. I'm not yet finished with the Sabbath. Questions about the Sabbath. All right, no questions. Let me jump on. Go to Genesis 2. Again, the Sabbath is a subject that can take weeks and weeks and weeks, and we don't have that. Genesis 2. <clears throat> Let's read from verse 21. You read for me. And Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. 
And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, Come on, this is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's the first wedding, the first marriage. That's one institution. The other institution was the Sabbath. The two of them, the Sabbath as a law originated from Eden. The Sabbath as a principle has always existed. Don't ask me about that, I'll talk later. The Sabbath as a law originated in Eden as a principle has always existed. Or the Sabbath as a specific day originated in Eden, but the principle has always existed. So we have the Sabbath and we have marriage. Two holy institutions that came out of Eden. Now, go to Luke 20, read from verse 34. Luke 20, 34. <clears throat> Do you have that? Read for me. As, uh -huh. The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. Stop. What does he mean by the children of this world? Hmm? Is there another world? Is there another world coming? Oh, come on. Is there another world coming? Yes. Let's keep reading. The children of this world, come on, read with me. Marry and are given in marriage. Keep reading. But they, they shall be counted worthy, come on, to obtain, to obtain what? What is that world? The new world that God is making. We have this world and we have that world. So this is something near, that is something far. We have this world, the children of this world. They marry. Those who are counted worthy to obtain that world, meaning it's coming. Keep reading. Neither marry, go on. What does that tell you about life in the new world? There's no marriage. Go to Isaiah 66. Read verse 23. Isaiah 66, reading verse 23. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a prophecy of the new world. What will we do in the new world? We keep the Sabbath. But what do we learn about marriage in the new world? It won't be there. No more marriage. No more childbearing. I hope you still want to go. Are you with me? <laughs> Some people, when they hear that, they say, I'm not going. Please go. Because the alternative you won't like. Are you following me? And so in the new world, there's no marriage, no giving in marriage. This all ends here. Because marriage was a temporary arrangement to produce children. That's it. When God has what he wants, no more marriage, no more children. Okay. Everyone in the new world will grow up, I, I imagine. Now, but the Sabbath will always continue because it is a memorial of creation. It reminds us that God created, God can provide and sustain us. Will we need to be sustained in the new world? Yes. Nothing can live disconnected from God. Nothing and no one. The angels are sustained by God. And so we'll always have need to celebrate the Sabbath as a constant reminder that we are sustained, maintained, our lives are preserved by God. He uses instruments, the tree of life, the river of life. But the power that sustains is the power of God, not H2O. The power of God. H2O is just an instrument in God's hands. Yes, my good sister. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 
It's a diversion, but I'll be merciful. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Listen to me carefully. You're all reasonable people. How many days did God make? Seven. How many did he keep for himself? One. How many did he give you? Get married on one of them. Hmm? It doesn't make any difference to me. Don't attend. Don't get married on it. Leave God's day alone. Pick Wednesday. <laughs> it's the same for funerals. Get buried on a Monday. Tell people, bury me on Monday, not on the Sabbath. Are you with me? Why don't we leave God's Sabbath alone? I get this. Should, should I have sex with my wife on Sabbath? You have six days. Who thinks of Ellen White when they... <laughs> okay, forget that. <laughs> Who thinks of steps of Christ when they're... Uh, all right, okay, okay, okay. Leave God's day alone. Is that on record? Leave God's day alone. Please, you have six days. Do what you like. Leave the Sabbath alone. Get buried on Monday, marry on Wednesday, and have a child on Thursday. Leave the Sabbath alone. Please. Don't get married on it. Don't get divorced on it. Don't go to somebody else's wedding on it or somebody else's funeral. By the way, I've never seen a spiritual wedding. I never said it don't exist. I have never seen a spiritual wedding. Every wedding I've gone to, including mine, the focus was, what is the bride wearing? What are the bridesmaids wearing? How does she look? Not God. That's another story. <laughs> Dr. James, that's a good question. <laughs> a spiritual wedding is one where God is the focus. God, also a spiritual funeral. God is the focus, not the bride. God. And the spiritual significance of a wedding as it relates to Christ and his church. Because as Adam said, this is born of my bone, the same thing is said of Christ and the church in the Ephesians chapter 5. We are born of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Marriages are good things, but I have not seen a spiritual wedding. Or a spiritual reception. All right. The Sabbath will be kept in the new world. Marriage will not be practiced in the new world. The Sabbath clearly is a higher institution than marriage. Marriage's usefulness will end in this dispensation, the Sabbath will continue forever and ever. Now, I, saw, I told you that uh, the Sabbath as a day began in Eden. As a principle, it always existed. Let me show you something. Or let me try to show you. Go to Genesis 1.1. Has anyone said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth? Who said that? Ah, thank you, thank you. The rest of you, you're not praying, but okay. I still love you, God's people. All right. Genesis 1 1. Say it for me. In the beginning, we have God. Okay, we have God. What? Created. And we have the heaven and earth. All right. Now. I want you to look at that very closely. Let's pray again. Father in heaven, please be with me. Again, I ask if I've said anything wrong, forgive me, God. Help me to make it simple and to keep you as the focus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the beginning, come on, God did what? Created the heaven and the earth. So we have God and we have creation. Okay, under God, we have Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Are you with me? All right, so we have Father, Son, all of them are divine, Holy Spirit. Okay. What do we have under created or creation? 
Come on. Go through the six days. What do we have under creation? We have, okay, let's, living things. We have man. But before man, what did God create? Before the earth was made, what was already in existence? Before the earth was made and long before that, before Lucifer's sin, what had God created? Angels. So we have, let's take this line off. We have angels under creation. Not at the same time as man, but before him. But we still have, we have man. We have animals. We have plants. These are things that live. We have birds. Now, watch, listen to me carefully. We're talking about the Sabbath. We have God. We have creation. Does God exist, yes or no? Does creation exist, yes or no? What else exists? Let me give you a clue. Listen to the word of God. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. All things were made by God. So we have God and we have all things. Is there any other thing that exists? No. Are you with me? No. God made everything. We have God and we have everything made. Comes under creation. Which means there are only two ways to exist in the universe. What are the two ways? You can either exist as God or you exist as part of creation. There's no other way to exist. Tell me if you understand what I just said. There are only two ways to exist in the universe. As God or as part of creation. Okay. We said angels. Let's identify an angel. Let's take out, let's take out angels and we just put Gabriel. Birds we have, let's have insects down here, and let's put worms. Let's put amoeba, single-celled organism. Am I right? You have amoeba in Australia? All right. Now, listen to me carefully. Right now in heaven, the highest created being is uh, Gabriel. But where do we find Gabriel, over here or over here? Over there. Why? He's created. Where do we find the amoeba? Over here or over here? Is the amoeba and Gabriel, are they similar in any respect? What respect? They were created. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> let's say the amoeba got a promotion from amoeba to worm. What doesn't change? It's created. Let's say he moves up a couple steps. Now he's a, a bird, an eagle. What remains the same? He's created. The one thing that none of these can shake is that they are created. That cannot change. Whether you're as high as Gabriel or as low as an amoeba, you're created. How do they live? Sustained by this. Then what's the relationship between that and that? What should it be in this direction? Okay, worship is good. That's not what I want, but worship is good. Start. I say. Okay, obedience is good. You can never get rid of obedience. It's good. Dependence. Now, what we, in order for them to be sustained, they have to... We, it, the, the relationship is dependence. Dependence moving in which direction? Yes. Does Gabriel depend on God? Yes. Does the amoeba depend on another power? Yes. There is something that gives a common status to everything beside God, and that is created. 
So while you may change your place on the ladder of created beings, you cannot change your status as being created. Satan didn't like this. I'm created. The only other change you can make is to be what? God. Because if you go from amoeba to insect, you're still created. Am I confusing you? If you go from bird to, 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 to whatever, man, you're still created. The only way to shake the creation tab is to be God. Because God is not created. Lucifer didn't like that. So he said, I'll be like him. But the Sabbath is a constant reminder. No, 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 no. If you are created, you depend. Now, you don't need a day for this. This is a lifestyle. Every moment of every day, you depend on God. The principle of the Sabbath is depend, the consciousness. I depend on God for vision. I depend on God for the release of acetylcholine across the synaptic cleft, whatever you call it, so that information can move from one neuron to the other. God keeps that eye. The Bible says, in him we live and move and have our being comprehensive. The Sabbath reminds us. You depend on God. Now, there was no day before Adam was made. There was just a principle. When God made Adam, God created days. Now, what I'm about, well, no, let me keep my opinions to myself. God created days, which did not exist in the days of Lucifer. Now God has a system where this is celebrated one day a week. Notice I said celebrated, not not. Not just as you forget it, the other six. It receives, receives special attention. I depend on God. God is my sustainer. God is my creator, not my job. The Sabbath. I'm a created being. And there's nothing I can do to change that. And I depend on God for life. The Sabbath is a reminder of that. Now, we have six days to work. Now, in six days of work, you know, let's say you work for the government, you are advisor to the president, you may think, well, advisor, surely I can move over here. Yeah, this, this is a big position. Why am I over here? I want to be over here. But on the Sabbath, God, as it were, puts his hand in your chest. You see, you, you're trying to move out of your place. <laughs> God says, stop, stop, go back. Back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. You created back up, back up. You're stepping out of your place. Every Sabbath, back up. Because the only way to know where I properly belong is to understand where God properly belongs. Are you following me? When I understand where God belongs, I understand where I belong and I stay there. But this is not a position of suffering. Those on this side are... Recipients of God's sweetest blessings. God doesn't bless himself. God blesses us. Sabbath observance is a recognition of the fact that I depend on God. It doesn't mean I'm lazy. I depend on him. Whether there's a day or not, that principle of dependence has always existed. As long as the first thing was created, dependence began. The devil wants to remove that. So he attacks the Sabbath more than any <coughs> other of the Ten Commandments. And he has attacked it with great success. There are Christians who say the Sabbath was for the Jews. Go to Genesis 2. Let me take this off the board. Genesis 2. Let's see the Jews. By the way, anyone who accepts Christ is a spiritual Jew. <coughs> Genesis 2, 1 to 3. Read for me. 
heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now, before I get to the Jews and the Sabbath being for them, let's look at that again and see a sequence of events. It is essential to destroying this business of Sunday's the Sabbath. <clears throat> Listen again. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Why did God bless it and sanctify it? It's right there. Finish the verse. Because that in it, he had rested. So God rested on the seventh day. God rested. On how much of the day did God rest? The whole day. Now, why did God, now think with me, why did God bless that day? Okay, let, let me put it this way. We have rest, then we have blessed. Which one came first? Rest. On how much of the day did God rest? The whole day. Follow me closely. Follow the word closely. God did something first. He rested. Because he rested, then he blessed. So when would he have to have blessed? After he rested. How much of the day did he rest on? The whole day. So when God blessed, what day was it? What day was it when God blessed? It was Sunday. Oh, I lost you. As usual. It's my fault. Watch this. How many hours in a day? Okay. God rested the entire day. When he was done resting, the day was done. Then he did what? He blessed. So when God blessed the seventh day, what day was it? It was Sunday. So God looked back and blessed the Sabbath because why? I rested on, I, God didn't bless, he blessed the seventh day, but it was Sunday when he did that blessing. Go to the fourth commandment. See the same thing spoken. Commandment 4, Exodus 20, reading from verse 11. <clears throat> Exodus 20, reading from verse 11. Read with me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Go on. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Now, wherefore, what does wherefore mean? Because of this. Because he rested. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day, the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. The sequence of events is this. God rested first. When his rest was over, you see, he blessed the whole day. He rested on the whole day. Then he blessed. It was Sunday when God blessed the seventh day. By the way, the first Sabbath was not the first seventh day. The first Sabbath was the next seventh day. Because when God rested, it was not yet blessed. Are you following me? Are you following? Are you sure? Think. You're all geniuses. Think. He rested. Still a secular day. When the rest was done, then he blessed it. So the, the first Sabbath kept by Adam and Eve was the next Saturday. 
God stood on Sunday and blessed Saturday. And this commandment has never been changed from then until now. It is still the seventh day that is the Sabbath. Most of the world recognizes Sunday in recognition of the resurrection of Christ. That's almost like saying in recognition of sin. Here's what I mean. If Adam had never sinned, would there have been a resurrection? No. Would it still be Sabbath? Yes. When sin is done away with, we live in a perfect world, will there be Sabbath observance? Yes. Will there be resurrection? No. God's holy law has always been, it is now, and will always be there. Why? It is the foundation of his government. Remove it, the government collapses. One of the functions of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to remind the world that the Sabbath is the seventh day, not the first. That's from creation. Okay. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by the first seventh day, Adam and Eve already existed. Mm -hmm. it, it anywhere in the Bible tells if they walked on the first or seventh day. Oh, the Bible doesn't say. But if God rested, we can be fairly sure they rested too. Mm -hmm. Because God was fellowshipping with them. They hadn't sinned yet. And God had a habit of coming down into the garden, as we read in verse, uh, they heard the voice of the Lord God, verse 8 of chapter 3. So we don't believe, the Bible doesn't say, but you have to reason that it didn't work. They rested with their God, but the day wasn't holy yet. So even if they did walk on the first seventh day, it wouldn't be sin because it was not yet Sabbath. Well, it wasn't a Sabbath yet. Mm -hmm. Interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> okay. Is blessing somebody at work? Is what? Is blessing somebody at work? No. Even if it's work, he did it on Sunday, not on Sabbath. No, no, but then is it to say that the day is Sabbath work? Uh, he didn't bless on Sabbath. On Sabbath. Uh huh. Is, is blessing somebody a work before he rests from work? No, we didn't rest from blessing. He rested from the work of creation. Yeah. Not from blessing, the work of creation. So why does the blessing have to be on the first day? Because he rested first. I don't know why he did it that way, but he rested first. After he rested, he blessed the day. And then told us, you keep that day. Now, as to why he did it, I'll ask him when I see him. But he rested first. Then he blessed. That's the, that's the order. So that's what the word says. The rest and blessing cannot go together. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying they can't go together. I'm simply saying they come in a certain order. God rested first. Then he blessed the day because he had rested. The rest is the reason why he blessed. Then the reason must come before the action. It's not complicated. But the rest means that he ceased to do even the work of blessing. He ceased his work. He ceased from creation. Yeah, but blessing is not a work. So why he cannot rest and bless the same thing? I don't know. You have to ask him that. I said, I seriously, I don't know. I, we may be making this more difficult than it is. God ceased from his work of creation. Are you with me? Because uh, if... No, God, no, wait, let, let me take by that, no. The reason why God blessed the seventh day is because he rested on it. That's the reason for the blessing, yes. The special blessing. Now, God blessed before the Sabbath came along because he blessed the animals and said, be fruitful, multiply. Are you following me? He blessed Adam and he said the same thing. But that's not a Sabbath blessing. That blessing was to make the animals fruitful. He blessed man, make them fruitful. The Sabbath blessing made it holy. The animals are not holy. The Sabbath blessing makes it holy. And the reason he made it holy, he did something. He rested. 
The rest is the reason for the blessing. It came at the end of the day when it was finished. That is why if you call the first day the Sabbath, you're saying that God rested on the first day. The reason for this blessing of the Sabbath is rest. He did not rest on the first day. Because if he rested on the first day, there's no light. Are you following me? All right. Mm -hmm. I don't recall. I don't. Was it the Sabbath? Go to John 2. Go to John 2. Let's read from verse 1 of John 2. The wedding at Cana. Not Sabbath day, just third day. Okay, we don't need to read. That's fine. All right. Okay, 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 okay. All right. Okay. I don't know. That doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right because the whole day. Abraham had two wives. He was wrong. But God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So we must be careful how we make comparisons. He was dead wrong. Solomon was as wrong as any man can be. He had a thousand. So, that, you know, he got, the fact they had a six-day wedding doesn't make it right. Or a nine-day funeral. Say that again. He's got Jews. Mm -hmm. What does he make it? It says wedding said six days, not seven days? Whether they make it seven or eight or nine, it doesn't change the fact. It doesn't make it right or wrong. You understand what I'm trying to say? The worst people to serve as examples for us are the Jews, quite frankly. <laughs> because they never stop disobeying God. You know, Moses said, you've been hard-headed from the day I met you. So the Jews are not an example. Our example is Christ. All right, before we do any more nitpicking, let's move on to something else. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the seventh day is the Sabbath. In it, thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, my manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger. So if someone's staying in your house who's not an Adventist, and the Sabbath comes, that person has to fall in line. Because that person's under your roof. Whether it's a relative or stranger, the person under your roof must fall in line. Whether the person believes it or not, there's no work in my house on Sabbath, there's no this, there's no that, this is the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Someone's in your roof. It's if this is your home, when I say your roof, I don't mean your physical roof. I mean your home. Because if you rent that room, I rent this. That's not my home. This is it, my home. Then if you live under my, in my home, you come under the rules. Yes. What if the seventh-day Adventist is living under somebody else's roof? Mm -hmm. They still have to observe God's holy day. Yes. yes. So if an Adventist lives in, a, in the home of a, I don't know, a Satanist, you still have to keep God's holy day. You follow me? Or find some other place to live. There's no, there's no exception. But if the stranger is in your house, he has to follow you. Mm -hmm. But how, but, but, but my scenario is that he persistently do not follow in the Sabbath. What should I do? Say it again. If you say that people in the Under your house, yes. He does not follow that day. Also, I persuade him, he does not live there. Uh-huh. Where he finds somewhere else to live. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or you shouldn't have taken him in the first place. Even if it's a relative. Listen to me. Nothing comes ahead of obedience to God. If my father lives in my house. I will not respect my Sabbath. He has to go. I'll find some other place for him. I don't mean throw him out the window. I'll find, I'll find another place. I'll pay for it. I'll find it. I'll get someone to do housekeeping. But he's not staying in my house. Because my first responsibility is to God. Never, ever forget that. In a, did, uh, is it that a, a call to stand apart, page 9, paragraph 2. At a very early age, Christ had begun to make 
decisions for himself in the formation of his character. And not even respect and love from his parents could turn him from thus saith the Lord. To turn him from obedience to his father's word. Thus saith the Lord was his reason for every action that varied from the family customs. There were times when the family wanted to do this and Jesus said no. As a child. And he gave his reason, thus saith the Lord. Because his father was first. He loved Mary, he loved Joseph, but his heavenly father was first. Eloi said at a very early age, Jesus had begun to make decisions for himself in the formation of his character. Not even respect and love for his parents could turn him from his father's word. Thus said the Lord was his reason for every action that varied from the family customs. There were times when Mary and the other children wanted to do something. Jesus, I'm not doing that. And give a biblical reason. Because the Heavenly Father was first to him. It's not easy as it sounds. But, because we can't see God. We see our husbands, our wives, our cousins. We see them. And if we put them out, we see them crying. We see them struggling. But we don't see God. So our hearts are, but no, no, no. God must come first. If it's your home, everyone under your roof must show respect for the Sabbath day. Now, you can't change the person's heart, but he will not work on your day or play Olivia Newton-John on your day. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Today we have one button uh, equipment. Uh-huh. So it's easy to disobey. <laughs> That's what you're saying. It's easy to... Cooking, you see, I'm glad you said that. Listen to me carefully. We find clever arguments to get around God. The Bible says, don't cook. It didn't say, don't cook meals that take a long time. He said, don't cook. Just don't cook. Whether on a stove, on outside, or in a microwave, don't cook. And drop the subject. Warming up is not cooking. Ellen White is clear. There's no need to eat cold food. But she said, don't cook. <laughs> now listen, the internet is listening to us, you know. <laughs> they wonder, who are these rebels in Australia? <laughs> so we got to be careful. Listen to me. Always find ways to obey, not to disobey. Find ways to obey, not to disobey, and see the miracle working power of God in your lives. Don't cook. If you're tempted to cook, fast on that day. You'll not die. Mm -hmm. Ah, all right. Anything else? Okay. Let's look at another thing that comes to us from Genesis. Let's go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. <laughs> I'll miss you when I leave. <laughs> Genesis 1. Do you, are you there? Amen. All right, let's read verse 11. Let's pray again. Father, we're in the final session. In the name of Jesus Christ, be with us, Lord. Despite the fact I'm the one leading out, you, through your spirit, you make things clear to your sons and daughters and give them a heart to obey. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Verse 11, Genesis 1, and God said what? Amen. Let the earth bring forth grass. The herb yielding seed and the fruit yielding fruit after yielding seed after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. All right. And the earth brought forth what? Grass, verse 12, an herb yielding seed and the fruit yielding fruit. Who, whose seed was in itself upon the All right. Now, God made fruit trees on the third day. Go to verse 9 of chapter 2. Read for me. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right. So we have a repetition. Fruit trees were made as a source of food. Now go to verse 29 of chapter 1. Are you there? 
Verse 29, chapter 1. Read with me. And God said, Behold, I have given you every tree which is upon the face of, and every in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding to you it shall be for, and to every beast of thee, and to every fowl of thee, and to every one move quick upon the earth where in this life I have given every green herb for meat. Now, God's arrangement was every living thing will eat plants. Every living thing will eat plants. I mean, plants are living things. I don't mean plants. <laughs> People, animals, birds, plants. In the sea, plants. Now, by the way, at the bottom of every food chain is a form of plant life. If you study science. At the bottom of every food chain is a form of plant life. Plants are the most abundant form of life on the earth. Because everyone had to eat plants. So God's arrangement was, eat from vegetation. Have a vegetarian diet. That's God's plan. That was before sin. Sin entered the world, and God allowed a change. Yes? Sorry. Just to clarify, was it vegan or vegetarian? I said vegetarian. But before sin, it had to have been vegan. Because there's no contamination, no chemicals, no whatever, dye, no sugar. Okay, well, take out the sugar, no something else. Okay, all right. <laughs> now, here comes sin. The flood comes. Everything is destroyed. God allows people to eat meat. But even before the flood came, go to Genesis 7. See something that I don't know if people read it before they say, that uh, clean and unclean meats are for the Jews. Genesis 7, reading from verse 1, what does the Bible say? Unto Moses, come thou, unto Noah, sorry, come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Read verse 2. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female. And of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Stop. What do you notice in verses 2 and 3? Of verse 1, verse 2? We have clean and unclean. There were no Jews around. This is hundreds of hundreds of years before there was a Jew. The concept of clean and unclean is not a Jewish thing. It's a biblical thing. Go to chapter 9, read verse 4. Read verse 4 of chapter 9. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the... Come on, read. Shall you not eat? So here we have, don't eat blood. This is not a Jewish thing. You know, we eat kosher foods. This is a universal thing. Now, why do I say universal? To whom was God speaking? Noah and? Yeah. How many were they? What do they constitute? The population of the world. How many people has, have to be there for it to be the population of the world? Seven billion? No, eight is the population of the world. God gave those laws to the population of the world. Don't eat blood. By the way, that's a good reason not to eat meat. Are you sure all the blood is out? Hmm? Can you be sure all the blood is out? One good reason not to eat meat, even if it's clean meat. <laughs> All right. And so we have God giving a diet. Genesis 129 and 30, plant life. Let me show you something. Tell me if it makes any sense at all. We have three eras. We have before sin. What's the diet? Plants. After sin, what's the diet? Plants. During sin, what did God allow? Meat, clean meat. But we can also choose plants. Okay. Step over here. Before sin, the diet was plant-based. 
When sin is removed, the diet will be plant-based. Where are we preparing to go now in this life? The new world. How should we prepare? By living that life now, which is this. I tell you something else. Let's look at two words. Ideal and allowed. Okay. What's the ideal diet? What's allowed? Mm -hmm. Now, let's apply that to divorce and marriage. In marriage, what is ideal? Stay together. What's allowed? Divorce. You're not following me. What is God's desire in a marriage? Stay together. Jesus said, because of the hardness of your heart, God allowed you to divorce. So divorce is the result of sin. Staying together is God's preference. Plan animal meat is the result of sin. This is ideal. This is allowed. Divorce is allowed. Staying together is ideal. Let's put it this way. Let's put ideal over here. Let's put allowed down here. Let's put it in an academic setting. This is an A grade, A plus. This is a D plus. When you take a course, are you with me? What's the ideal grade? What's the bare, the bare minimum to pass? D plus. Now, you need brain surgery. Are you with me? You need a surgeon. <laughs> Which one do you want? <laughs> now talk to me. Which one do you want? The one who passed at this level? You want the one who passed at this level? Now we're preparing for a world where there's no, no death, no dying. Do we prepare by eating this? We go for what's ideal because that's what God wants. How do you prepare for an Olympic event by smoking? Are you following me? You're training for a marathon by smoking. <laughs> yes, the Bible mentions clean meats and unclean meats. But remember, in the Bible, there are periods. In the days of kings, God could tell a king, go and destroy that nation. But after the Israelites were taken into captivity and Zedekiah, was, he was the last king, he, God never did that again. That's why Christ can tell Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. That's why the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. One day, he will be, it'll be his again. So times change. In the days of Noah, there was no third angel's message. We have it now. So the fact that you could eat meat way back doesn't mean you should eat it now. Times change. We are now in the day of atonement phase of, of, of spiritual history. And day of atonement takes place in the most holy place. That's where the priest functioned, mainly. The only day when he went in there. No meat was taken in there. So, so you ask yourself, what diet is best suited for spiritual development? Because diet and spirituality go together. What diet is best calculated to improve the, the functioning of my mind? To clear up my arteries so blood can get to where it wants to get. And it's not a meat diet. Now, if you eat meat on your birthday alone, will I call the police? No. <laughs> Are you with me? I'm not calling the police. <laughs> but if it's your lifestyle, I won't call them either. But I'll tell you this, you shouldn't do that. You're hurting yourself. Every major medical organization, the Heart Association, the Cancer Association, they recommend in the dietary suggestions, cut back or eliminate uh, flesh foods. And they say eat plant, you know, vegetables, You and I have to decide, what will I do? 
Do I want a diet based on death? Death is a result of sin. Do I know the conditions under which those animals live? Am I happy to eat it as long as someone else slits its throat and I don't see? Don't you understand animals were made to have fellowship with us? That's why God made them. To fellowship with us. As I tell my people, animals were made to be our friends. Stop eating your friends. <laughs> I'm serious. Which of you has a dog? How does a dog behave when you come home? Oh, boy. You see some evidence of what God intended before sin. When you watch a dog and the owner. Go on the YouTube and watch how some lions react when they see those who raised them. You just can't believe it. And the thing purrs like a house cat. Some evidence of what God originally intended when he made animals. A fellowship. Not food. But it's a personal choice. And you'll be directed by the Spirit of God. But the biggest argument is, Diet affects spirituality. And diet comes right out of Genesis 1.29. So my recommendation for you is plant-based diet as your lifestyle. As I said, you eat some salmon on your birthday. I'm not going on the jury to condemn you. No, 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 no. And I said, it's not the occasional good deed or misdeed, but the direction of the life. All right. Ask me a question on diet. What about eggs? What about, eggs? What about them? Should you eat them? <laughs> now, Ellen White said eggs have healing properties, but she says the time will come when it will not be safe to eat them. Now, who determines when that time has come? Only you can determine that. I can't determine that for you. But she does say eggs have healing properties. But there were no eggs in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and no milk. No eggs, no milk. Another question on diet. Oh, well, there's some ice cream made without milk, I think. Why what? Um, That's an expression. It's an expression. But even when they drank milk back then, the pollutions we have now, we didn't have then. <laughs> the chemicals that exist now never existed before. Thousands of chemicals have been developed that did not exist 200 years ago. So we're dealing with different kinds of animals. There was no, was that a cow, was that hoof and mouth, hoof and tail disease, something? That didn't exist hundreds of years ago and didn't. So we're dealing with a different environment. We didn't have a, 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 a plastic in the ocean the size of Switzerland floating around. No, we didn't have that. So animals then were much safer than now. Milk was much safer than now. Eggs much safer than now. This is a different world. We're fish die of plastics in their stomach. And we, that's the world we live in. An animal steak, but um, uh, what uh, uh, all those things you inject in animals? Um, hormones and antibiotics, and, uh, and then they're genetically modified. And, oh. I read of a, uh, a cabbage that was grown with genes from a cold water fish. So the cabbage can grow in cold weather. <laughs> I don't want that cabbage. <laughs> No, seriously, they took genes from a fish that lives in deep cold water and somehow put it in the, the genes of a cabbage and the cabbage survives in cold water, in cold weather. Mm -mm. Even plants are not safe, all of them. Grow your own plants with your own soil. Diet is everything. Everything. Hmm. All right. Any other questions? Yes, my good sister. So, not it's all right. Diet at all. 
What is the Pope doing? <laughs> no, I ask seriously, what's the Pope doing? He addressed Congress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he, he met in Philadelphia with the um, honor of family day. Okay, okay. Um, can you comment on current events and how All right, okay. Now, yeah, these things happen, and they have been happening for a while. But when you read the Bible, while we should be aware of these things, we should not be able to give them greater attention than they deserve. The Bible says, when this, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. I'm saying that to say, while we must be aware, and no one is more aware than we are because we have the lens of prophecy, you see, we must not be ignorant. But God is not waiting on what the Pope does to come back. He's waiting on what we do. You understand me? So we must be aware, but we must not give disproportionate attention to the Pope or the Illuminati of Vladimir Putin. We need to do what we're called upon. God is waiting on us. Christ Object Lessons, page 69, paragraph 1. Christ is waiting with longing desire for, uh, I don't have the precise words there, the reproduction of his character in his people. When that happens, he'll come to claim them. When the gospel is preached, he'll come to claim them. So yes, my good sister, we must be aware. Because we know Sunday laws will be passed. We know the churches will come together as one. Everyone won't become a Catholic, but they'll all unite under one for one enemy. That's God's commandment, keeping people. Even as in the days of Jesus, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Zealots, the, 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 the Essi, whomever, they came together for one enemy, that's Jesus Christ. So that will happen. And the United States will stretch forth his hand over to Europe, papal power with the false prophet in the U.S., and then, of course, the mark of the beast will, 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 um, will be erected and uh, we have to be aware of this. But of greater concern to us should be, am I preaching the message God wants me to preach? And am I living the life God wants me to live? So yes, things have been going on for a long time. I mean, several years in the 90s, there was a, a, an agreement was signed between the Catholics and the, the, the Protestant churches to agree on doctrines and lay aside the differences. Then about four years ago, this guy got on TV talking about the Reformation is over, and Pope uh, Benedict or Frank, somebody appeared with him and made some statements that the Reformation is over, and the guy's now dead. <laughs> and <laughs> these things are going on. They've been going on for a long time. Poland just passed a law. Was it Poland? No business on... On Sunday law. Mm -hmm. I mean, Europe has Sunday laws, just not enforced. The papacy has been pushing to have them enforced. The last edition of the Catechism, 1994, tremendous big bestseller, they called for Catholics to push their legislators to pass a legal day of worship. It looks like simple like legal day means if you don't follow it, there are penalties, you understand. A legal day of worship. So this has, and it will come to a head, it will be passed. And so, yes, it's good to be alert. But our emphasis now should be on what are we supposed to do? Are we preaching the message? You understand? When Christ came the first time, almost nobody knew. Because the Jews didn't do something. They didn't preach the message. They didn't study it, didn't know it. Nobody knew. It wasn't the fall of the Babylonians or the Assyrians. The Jews didn't do it. In these last days, the Adventists are not doing it. We spend time talking about how hard it is to win a Buddhist and a Muslim and a Hindu and a whatever else. No, it is how hard it is to win an Adventist. How hard it is for God to get us to do what we're supposed to do. But yes, the Brother Pope is very busy. And uh, his activities are indications that the time is near. You were... Uh, <laughs> Almost every area of social activity is prepping for the coming of Christ in the sense that either negatively or positively, things that will happen. The climate is changing. And if you think you've seen catastrophes, worse will come. The tsunami of 204, 206, you know, worse will come. This volcano spewing in Alaska, not Alaska, Hawaii nonstop, worse will come. 
and it will happen in places where they never happened before. So while we have earthquakes in California and blizzards in Michigan, we may have earthquakes in Michigan and blizzards in California. So it requires us to take our eyes off secular things as our emphasis and really live spiritual lives. A spiritual life doesn't mean you don't go to church, or, I mean you don't go to work, or you don't go to the gym. It means that you live an alert life. What's the government doing? How am I responding? But remember, Christ never authorized his disciples to criticize the government. He never did. L.Y. says he never did. He criticized the church, not the government. All right. It's about 10 to, we're done. I, uh, let me urge you as your friend, your brother in Christ, make the study of God's word a priority in your life. Please. It is, a, it is an obedient life that it prepares us for placing God's kingdom, not just a decent life. A true Christian will be decent, but a person can be decent and not a Christian. Remember what Jesus said in the days of Noah. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. What did he say about the days of Lot? They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. Not one of these things is a crime. But they were lost. How can you be lost for living life as usual? Because life as usual is not good enough. Lost. Don't let that happen to us. Let's have an emphasis. In everything we do, there must be a conscious desire to prepare for the coming of Christ because he is coming. Let him not come and find us busy with another exam and another child. Let him come and find us waiting for him, actively waiting. So may God bless you and may your life be the reason why other people are saved. Do what you have to do. Take care of business because we're still in this life. But as I said, do it in such a way that it becomes obvious that you are preparing for the coming of Christ. Because he's coming. Thank you for granting me this privilege. I speak again at uh, 7. Is it the same thing? Men again? <laughs> what, where's Johnny? What's the topic for tonight? Okay, all right, okay, 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 all right, okay, okay, all right. Teaching the word with power. Doing what? Oh, okay, 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 all right, okay. So I will find a quiet place to retire and rest this thing. <laughs>